Welcome to 1995 Screamers Review and Thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I liked. Parts of it I came very close. Parts of it I do love, but on the whole, overall, like it. This video will have some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you are looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the source you know, short story, so it sucks. Whether you agree with those assessment or not, this is not that review. And I, I will be comparing this to the short story, and I will only spoil the short story when I get into spoilers for the movie itself. So, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, the first chunk of this video is going to be a review where I won't spoil anything, and as soon as I end the review itself, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie and for the short story, I don't think I'm going to be spoiling anything else in it. And, yeah, including discussing the ending. And, yeah, so the movie is rated R, and it uses the rating fairly well. You know, by today's standards, it's definitely not a hard R, but, yeah, some of, some of the violence definitely does get you know, yeah, like there's um, there's some very, very harsh stuff, and the, um, yeah, there is some swearing, um, I might swear in this video as well, and that, right, yes, I have watched this movie once, and I just got done watching it before I hit record, and that brings us to the plot. So, yeah, the IMDb does a really good job, so I'm just going to be quoting that. On the distant mining planet, Series 6B, ravaged by a decade of war in the year 2078, a military commander stationed off-planet during this interplanetary war travels through the de devastated landscape to negotiate a peace treaty and discovers something sinister. Let's go with that. And... Yeah, so... Mm, probably the biggest, single biggest reason that I'm watching this, that, that I watch this and I'm doing this video, is I love Philip K. Um, Philip K. Dick. I, I, he's probably my single favorite author. And just, yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, I have at this point gotten used to that no, ad almost no adaptation is going to live up to his work. You know, but... Yeah, the the um, I still really enjoy these adaptations most of the time, and yeah, the fact that this was directed by Christian Duguay also, you know, he's 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 a director that I keep coming close to loving the work of, but I never completely like he comes so close to nailing some of these. So, yeah. And before I start talking details about the technical aspects, the people here are very talented. There's not there's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display. And yeah, let's get into the writing. So other than Philip K. Dick, R.I.P., uh, writing the original short story, the adaptation was initially written by Dan O'Bannon, R.I.P., and later, um, you know, there were there were some rewrites done by Miguel Tejada Flores, who I gotta say I need to watch more of this. Okay, I don't think I've watched right, right, Fright Night Part Two. I think is the only other movie that he's he wrote some stuff for The Lion King. Wow, did not see that coming. But but yeah. Um, 
those are the only things but I'm I'm just real quick you know among the things he has written uh, let's see uh, huh. okay now I'm struggling to find but I've, I read about some of the things in in doing research for this movie and one of the movies he wrote is like there's a there's a there's a psychiatrist who's apparently killing people based on their anxieties he wrote the story for beyond reanimator he wrote the he did write the the direct video sequel he created this show that i never even heard of until recently called s o z soldados o zombies and yeah it's um it's a tv show that's uh uh is it still on go well it had one season in 2021 not seeing anything so, yeah i guess it might not but yeah amazon prime video show the, the IBB summary says, A narco kingpin escapes from a high-security Mexican prison where his son finds refuge at a remote drug rehab facility located on the U.S. side of the border where they encounter deadly mutant zombies. Like, that sounds amazing. This, this guy really knows how to write fun, like, genre stuff. <laughs> One of his movies is called Solar Attack. I, I don't even need to do, yeah yeah I'll if I get a chance I'll watch it I don't need to know anything other than that title I I how you wrote a TV movie called Tales You Live Heads You're Dead multiple movies called Deceptions which are apparently like about aliens who look just like human beings and just yeah yeah I absolutely gotta watch more stuff written by him but yeah I'm not planning to to watch the the sequel it sounds bad so that one I probably won't but yeah I got I gotta watch other stuff written by yeah I've read everything Philip K Dick I've been able to most of the shorts he wrote and I read the novel that became Blade Runner, aka Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. See, even if you don't, you don't have to love his his like overall work. But if you don't love his titles, I don't I don't know how to talk to you. That's an amazing title. Yes, I get why it was changed for the movie. I'm not expecting anyone to go watch a movie called that. But yeah, Total Recall was called We Can Remember It for You Wholesale. Like, just amazing. Just yeah. Now, let's... Right, I did not end up copying in a lot of critic quotes. The only thing was the following. Story is the weakest link. It lacks inspiration outside of the core concept. That is... There's definitely some truth to that. But, yeah. Um, a lot of the writing is is good. They, they do a good job. The movie invents at least one character and basically the reason the character is there is so that he can have stuff explained to him but they make sure that it's just enough like the idea is that he's a rookie he just got to this war and he's walking around with Peter Weller's longtime you know what's what's it called um veteran longtime veteran so yeah Peter Weller is explaining stuff to him that in the book you know it's not really being explained to anyone it's just it's there you know you can you can do that in a book but if you're doing a movie you know you can do voiceover you can change it into dialogue those are you know you can try to visualize it but a lot of it is like stuff that happened before you know, it's not 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 like the way Avatar takes forever to get to anything because it, it has to do so much world building. But the things that are being explained, they wouldn't be that exciting to watch, and it would just delay the start of the story, which is already it's a it's a good starting point, you know. So, yeah, I I feel like they did a a good job here. It was a very good change. 
and let's see. So yeah, um, plot twists. Some of the plot twists are handled very well, but there are definitely at least a few too many plot twists, and some of them are just bad. And I would argue that at least one of them is too easy to figure out for the viewer, whether or not you've read the, the book. And that brings us to the direction. So yes, this is, you know, directed by Christian Duguay. Du Duguay? Ah, crap. I, I'm not great with, with I mean, it's got to be like, he's Canadian, so it's, I can imagine might be like a Canadian or French name. Yeah, uh, if I'm mispronouncing it, I certainly mean no offense. Um, let's see, maybe... Maybe the... Um, ah, does not seem like... No. I uh, uh, Wikipedia does not explain how to pronounce his name, so... Yeah, I might just go back and forth between the two pronunciations, but yeah. He is still working today, which is really cool. Um, the, the, let's see, the most recent thing was just last year, something called Tempete. And, yeah, something about horse, race horses. An accident threatens to bring racing careers to an end. They battle together to achieve victory. Yeah. You know, it's... He directs all sorts of stuff. Like, it's it's like with, with like, John Carpenter. Like, he, he... He'll do pretty much any genre that, like, at all is... Yeah. Now... Uh, let's see. So, so yeah, real quick... Ranking worst to best other than this one. I'll, I'll update with my ranking of this one when I get to the end of the review. But yeah, rank worst to best, and I do enjoy all of these. They're all enjoyable. Uh, you know, I'm... Yeah, I'm ranking how much I enjoy them, not whether or not I enjoy them all. And again, I, I don't quite love any of them. Of, yeah, the movies that he's directed, I don't, I haven't watched any of the ones he's written. Scanners 2 The New Order, Livewire, Scanners 3 The Takeover, which is probably the single most fun thing. He's not, like, if you're, if you don't mind that it really isn't anywhere near as serious as the first movie, or even the second, and that it's kind of, like, it almost plays like a parody. Think of it as, like, the alien resurrection of the Scanners series, you know, but... If you're down, like, I rewatched it just a couple of days ago, you know, what has it been, less than a year maybe since the first time I watched it and did a video on it, it's a ton of fun, still, even, even the second time, even knowing everything that was coming. Anyway, after that, Boot Camp, Human Trafficking, and Hitler, The Rise of Evil, which comes so freaking close to being good, like, I, I am almost definitely going to do a video specifically on that one, where I talk about exactly what works and exactly what doesn't about that one. It's, it certainly is an extremely important movie, or miniseries, it's a miniseries, so it's human trafficking. Extremely important miniseries to do, because we need to prevent, you know, Nazism from rising again. But yeah, so some IMDb trivia quotes in the original short story by Philip K. Dick. And I, you know, I did consider just referring to him as Philip K. so as to not offend, but he was kind of a dick. He was a bit of a misogynist, as you can tell from some of his writing. So, yeah, I will be calling him Dick. The plot takes place on Earth instead of Series 6B. Originally, Screamers were developed by American troops hiding in the moon to destroy the Russian army after the Soviet Union had completely wiped out the United States. So this is hugely different, and of course they can't go with that, after the ending of the the Cold War, you know, that would be kind of, a, like, then we then we might end up with something like Air Force One, with neo-Soviet forces, or whatever they were called, you know, where it's like, we really want to milk the Cold War, you know, some anxieties about the Ruskies some more, so, I don't know, 
Does that work? No, no, it doesn't. Fun movie, but completely absurd. Kind of, yeah. And early versions of the screenplay were titled Claw in reference to the villainous robots, which are called Claws in the original Flocadic short story, Second Variety, instead of Screamers. Let's see. At one point, Henriksen refers to someone sarcastically as a real perky pat. This is a reference to the short story The Days of Perky Pat. And the novel The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, both were written by Philip K. Dick, who wrote the short story Second Variety, on which Scanners is, Screamers is based. It's a tad on the nose, but I do always appreciate when a writer drops in a little thing that, like, you know, if you don't know the, the you know, yeah, you're not going to notice. You're not going to be like, what? What does that mean? You know, you're going to be, oh, you know, perky pat, you can, you can guess what that, like, yeah. But for us fans, it's like, Yes, someone who actually knows what they're talking about when they're writing this thing, you know. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. And this is Dan O'Bannon's second adaptation of Philip K. novel, the first being Total Recall. Actually, I suppose I sh you know, it's only fair to briefly go over. So, yeah, Dan O'Bannon, you know, he has he now has his name attached to every alien thing. There's a bunch of shorts based on characters created by, but, let's see, the, the, yeah, you know, he, yeah, apparently he didn't write Prometheus, it's based on elements created by, yeah, I think he's much, much better than, although he apparently wrote the screen story for Alien vs. Predator, yeah, but the story isn't really the worst part of that, anyway, but, but yeah, you know, he, other than this, he of course wrote the original Alien the, the entire screenplay, not only story, and, you know, I don't love it quite as much as a lot of people do, but it is definitely, it's very deserving of respect. I have a lot of respect for the original Alien. He wrote the original story and screenplay for Dark Star, which I know not everybody still loves, but I do. And oh right, he wrote he wrote a the story for a segment of heavy metal. Wow. He wrote the screen pro, screenplay for the Return of the Living Dead, which is where we got the detail that zombies eat brains. You know, before that, it was basically you know they'll eat the entire human body. You know, whatever. But that's where the brains thing comes from. And yeah. He did write the 1990, both the screen story and the screenplay, 1990 Total Recall, which legitimately is just, I, I love that movie. It's, there are definitely some differences between it and the short story, but, like, between Dan O'Bannon and Paul Verhoeven, it has the kind, like, was he, actually, I don't, no, no, yeah, he had, yeah. Uh, Philip K. Dick had died uh, before that movie came out. He died in 1982. But yeah, for sure, like, the weirdness of that movie, like, if you, if you like that movie, you never read any Philip K. Dick, like, not all of them are equally weird, but, like, there's probably some Philip K. Dick stories that you're gonna really, really vibe with. Um, a, a super quick example would be that the, I forget, uh, I think it's called Adjustment Bureau. The thing is that, the, yeah, the movie's called The Adjustment Bureau. The book, the short story, is called The Adjustment Team. If I recall, it's like two pages long, and it features a talking dog. So, if that's weird enough for you, you know, yeah, that's, that's the kind of ridiculous... You know, he, the, the man was on drugs. You know, he, he did do a significant amount of, of drugs. Anyway, but but yeah, Dan O'Bannon, you know, he really did a lot to, to make sure that Philip K. Dick would be remembered long past, you know, these, these stories that, you know, a lot of us love them, but they weren't huge by the time, you know, yeah. He, he, he lived poor for of um, a chunk of his life, uh, Philip K. Dick did, Dis you know, despite these incredibly interesting things that he wrote. Not all of them super weird. 
And yeah, so according to IMDb Trivia, Dan O'Bannon had been working on the screenplay for Screamers as early as 1981. And in 84, let's see, right, the, the October 10th, 1984 draft credits Michael Campus as co-writer. It is unknown whether Campus also intended to direct. Let's see, and... Right, so yeah, the designs of the helmets worn by Alliance Infantry are styled after Galea, the helmets of Roman legionnaires. This is something of a running theme in the film, with two call signs used by the soldiers, being Livy, a Roman historian, and Cicero, a Roman statesman. Hendrickson's Roman coin, as well as the repeated description of the screamers as autonomous swords. It is also noteworthy that the NEB, or NEB, uniform resembles the armor of a stylized medieval knight. Whether this is intended as a war never changes subtext, or is only an arbitrary design choice, is unclear. You know, it is entirely possible that it is just, you know, the, the, someone working on, someone who had a lot of input on design was like hugely in love with the, the, you know, the ancient Roman, that's entirely possible, but certainly it works, you know, accidental success is technically still success. And according to Wikipedia, the 1990s, uh, yeah, in the 1990s, Screamers went into production. By this time, the screenplay had been rewritten by Miguel Tejada Flores. O'Bannon was unaware that the film had been made until after its release, when his agent called him to notify of his, him of his screenwriting credit for the film. According to O'Bannon, they had kept much of the plot and characters from, original, from his original script, the same while changing much of the dialogue. And that is very clear. Like, this is not the same dialogue as Alien, the and Total Recall, the the nineteen ninety one. You know, this is this is much more like genre dialogue, and I will definitely talk about it. So, ranked worst to best, I dislike the lower four and love the rest. All of the Philip K. Dick movie adaptations I've watched. Next, Paycheck, Total Recall, twenty twelve, Minority Re Report. 2002 and yeah so the rest of these I love Blade Runner 1 Total Recall 1990 The Adjustment Bureau Scanner Darkly Blade Runner 2049 I realize that technically Blade Runner 2049 is not directly based on anything he wrote but I love that movie I could not possibly in good conscience leave it off that ranking it's yeah as you can tell I think easily the best thing inspired by the, the works of, of Philip K. Dick. And considering how big, like, the the entire scene where, I forget her name, but the the female, I'll, I'll have to momentarily, the test done to see if Rachel, if Rachel is a robot in Blade Runner, like, some of it is legit word for word from the novel. And you know, yeah, so, for, for sure, Philip K. Dick made a, a massive impression on the two movies. Now, so, yeah, and I, right, I copied in some stuff from Philip K. Dick's uh, own, yeah, the Wikipedia page specifically for Philip K. Dick, and, right, he wrote 44 novels and about 121 short stories, most of which appeared in science fiction magazines during his lifetime. His fiction explored varied philosophical, philosophical and social questions, such as the nature of reality, perception, human nature, and identity, and commonly featured characters struggling against elements such as alternate realities, illusory environments, monopolistic corporations, drug abuse, authoritarian governments, and altered states of consciousness. And, yeah, I suppose I won't give away exactly what, but yeah, some of that is very much in this. And that's the thing that, like, you could very easily have a, a story like this and just, you know, ah, it's, a, it's kind of a cool sci-fi concept, but not explore any of the ideas. And this movie doesn't do the best job, but it definitely does explore the ideas that, some of the ideas that are in the short story. And Philip K. Dick, like James Cameron the Terminator, was commenting on what it would do to us humans if there were, you know, uh, should I, hmm, 
you know what, I, I think I will save that one for the spoiler section there. There we go. But, but yeah, I, I don't know for sure, but I think that James Cameron also read some Philip K. Dick. It would certainly explain some of the things he put in some of his movies. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, some credit quotes. For the last 50 years, the NEB, NEB, New Economic Bloc Corporation, has controlled mining operations. They're the new economics on the block. They've been controlling mining operations throughout the known solar systems. Two decades ago, on the colony Sirius 6B, the company discovered the solution to the world's energy crisis, Viridium. But extracting it caused lethal levels of radiation and pollution, instigating a federation of scientists and workers called the Alliance to protest the operations. This led to an all-out war. The fighting was confined to Sirius 6B. Now in the tenth year of the war, the survivors on the once beautiful planet are faced with a new threat. So yeah, the short story was written during the Cold War, and like 110% of the things made during the Cold War, it is in part about the Cold War, and in fact very explicitly about the Cold War. So yeah, when the movie was directed, the Cold War had ended, even if the original screenplay was from during the Cold War, so basically they had to choose whether or not to keep the setting and possibly alienate a good chunk of the audience, the ones that didn't want to be reminded of it, the ones that didn't remember it, or didn't care anymore, or really diverge from such a central element of the story. So what they did was make it about a rivalry between large corporations. I cannot overstate how massive the difference is in these two conflicts, nor how much I think this is actually a really good choice given the circumstances. Before anyone jumps in and says Philip K. Dick was passionate about commenting on the Cold War, having read a ton of his stories, he was also passionate about commenting on corporations. He really did not like the idea of corporations. Like, I don't know if I want to give away which, but one of his stories legitimately, like, corporations have, like, Let's see, did they have as much or more power than the government? Something. Yes, now I remember. If you're um, if you're working for a specific corporation, I hope you're sitting down for this, the government can't touch you. You can commit crime and the government can't touch you. That was something that he, you know, I mean, some people would say, oh, wow, dude was a cynic. He actually kind of foresaw that look, there are people who've committed massive crimes, but they work for big corporations, so they aren't getting punished. You know, although I suppose you could say white-collar crime in general doesn't really get punished that much. But yeah, you know, so so yeah, th I, I would like to think that, you know, if he's turning over in his grave, it's just because he was lying on his hand and he's, he wants to give it a thumbs up. And yeah, I so I rewatched the the other Christian DeGay movies that I have in my possession in the days leading up to this. And just real quick, those are Scanners two and three, Boot Camp, and Hitler: The Rise of Evil. The only one I don't have a copy of is Human Treff. Oh right, and Livewire. Yeah. Ah, uh, did I not? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Those are, uh, and, and I don't think I need to watch Live Wire again. It was fine. You know, it was fine for a single viewing, but I don't need to watch it again. But yeah, so in rewatching, I noted Christian Duguay does display a very clear handle on genre, whether he's directing horror or action. If it's supposed to be creepy, it is. If it's supposed to be tense or exciting, it is. And that is also very much the case here. And let's see. See, uh, I suppose I will. That's a spoiler, so I'm going to put that in the spoiler section, which is here. There it is. And yeah, in Boot Camp, which he both directed and was director of photography for, he shows a very clear grasp on lighting for effect. Extremely important because that movie has a number of characters who have very different experiences. You know, the upper class rebellious brat, the druggie at the rave. Their introductory scenes make it extremely clear who they are in the economic running time of that movie. In addition, you know, he captures the the gloom, icy blue of night on the island, the the which is near ah. Is the island Fiji or is it near Fiji? Something like that. I'm not good at geography. 
and and the sunny days of the yeah of the island and in boot camp there's also very effective editing montages slow motion frame skips and yeah you know the the it's the kind of stuff that like you can really tell if someone like just got into it and they're just having fun playing with the toys or if it's someone who understands that the more you it's it's a you know the more you use this kind of thing the less effective it becomes so and and yeah that is also the case in in this the the you know the there's a very good sense of place in this like you you really feel like cuz like at the end of the day this is all like sets and some green screen and like you know there's the places that you see in this movie did not look the way they do in the movie in real life As, you know you can't just walk there and it's you know because it's a you know we're we're not on earth and the places that the you know so this you know this is a place that for a while was used for mining actually i suppose possibly still mining but yeah you know so you have these large refineries and you have these military bunkers for the cold war and you know yeah it's it's the the like if this was the only movie you watched you would assume oh i guess he only does science fiction movies set you know off earth but you know he's mo he's made plenty of stuff that isn't but he really really understands it you know this is there's a there's a huge this is completely different from something like Johnny Mnemonic, and I don't. I'm not gonna kick that. You know, I the movie wasn't successful. I don't want to kick kick it while it's down. But that movie's director, who I do want to underline, is very talented. He wasn't a movie director. He was. I, I want to believe. I want to. I want to say he was a he was a painter or something like that. You know. Uh, yeah, I couldn't. My mind couldn't decide whether I want to say I want to say or. I believe so just combine them yeah so you know talented guy not great at, at movie directing and and you know film direction it is very very difficult it is it is you know it's it's the kind of thing that really what what's that saying separates the separates the wheat from the chaff you know it's there's a lot of really talented people who have tried their hand at direction and they couldn't quite, you know. Um, the I, I recently rewatched the 1989 Punisher movie, and the yeah, it was directed by Mark Goldblatt, who has not directed that much. He's much more known as an editor, and yeah, you know. He's, you know, before you say, ah, oh, you know, he must not have done anything. No, 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 he, let's see. Yeah, so he edited Starship Troopers, Predator 2, The Terminator, you know, incredibly talented editor. You know, and, and you can tell he wanted to do a good job on the movie, but he couldn't quite hack it. And, you know, yeah, um, Christian DeGay, I'm not going to say that he, did, you know, like I said, I don't love any of his work. But he does understand. He's all you know. He he has a better grasp on it than someone like Paul W. S. Anderson, who does by and large under he he knows he understands the tools. He's just bad at like restraint from using the you know from excessive use of of the tools. I suppose I should briefly get into so the oldest thing that Christian DeGay directed that I've personally watched was Scanners Two. The new order, and yeah, in that one he does also display he you know, like, you know I I did a video on that I, essentially like it's kind of boring and the the writing leaves a lot to be desired but that's but you know that's not Christian DeGay's fault he didn't write it yeah you know the the he he has long had a handle on direction. And yeah, so so you know, there's some there's some very effective stark lighting in this. 
the you know, and really underlines how abandoned some of these places are, which you know, that that's the thing. Like if you don't know anything about lighting, you might think, well, if it's abandoned, I guess there's just no light. No, because that doesn't look good on film. You have to light it somehow, otherwise it's just going to be blackness. And that doesn't look particularly good on a big screen. You know, it looks good on, like, a comic book page. You know, some, some comics, you know, Sin City makes excellent use of uh, negative space, but the, the, um, or hold on, is negative space only when it's white? I, anyway, yes, so the, the, um, you have to light it, but the lighting has to feel like it has to be invisible, you know, it doesn't, because if there's a normal light source, you're like, this isn't abandoned, there's a light source right there, you know, so, but yeah, he knows what he's doing. Let's see, right, and Scanners 2 and 3, Human Trafficking Boot Camp, and Hitler Rise of Evil are in part about powerful people cruelly abusing their power against the powerless. There are major characters who face this cruelty. Some of them are broken and others aren't. I wouldn't really say that there are characters like on screen in this that, that are intentionally being cruel to to people who have way less power than them. But there are there are some revelations made that you know you realize that there's significant cruelty. So again, he didn't write any of these, but I do feel like he maybe is attracted to stories about that. And yeah, so before I start comparing this to the 1982 The Thing, I want to make absolutely clear that movie is one of my favorite, not only horror movies, but favorite movies of all time. You know, I've watched movies as far back as, I want to say the oldest is probably from 1929. Oh, technically a little bit further back. Yeah, I've, you know, I've watched silent films, you know, the, the, in all of, and, and I, I don't watch a huge amount of recent stuff, but I do watch recent stuff as well. 1982 is the thing. Rewatch it just yesterday. Holds up. Amazing movie. Any comparison I make, I'm not trying to, you know, this movie is in no way better than that. But some of the differences are worth getting into. So just, yeah, I want to say it is not that this movie is, is somehow better than that. Now, uh, yeah, so The Thing 1982 establishes the physical isolation with shots of seemingly endless snowy landscapes before the plot starts. And this does something similar. Like, at the very start, you wouldn't think that anybody, that there's any life left here. Like, it looks so abandoned, so destroyed, bombed to shit. There's nothing left here. And then you realize, oh, okay, there are actually, you know, and, yeah, so the, the thing 1982, a lot of the movie is talking. The characters are investigating, trying to figure out how to stop the threat they're dealing with, learning new traits about it, and a lot of it is in relatively samey sets and carry... Uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the dialogue is, you know, yeah, a, a big thing. There's not a lot of visual variety. Every so often there will be an explosion of action, but... Uh, let's see, yeah, so, so, yeah, to, to further, I'm not saying that that makes that movie bad, it makes that movie more, like, in, in that movie it works to make it feel basically like it's, it's not fun, there's a couple of jokes in the movie, but it's not fun, it's not fun for them, it's not fun for us. And that's the idea, you know, it's not supposed to be, it's, it's supposed to be intellectually and emotionally stimulating, but not fun, not like, you know, there's not a lot of bright colors in that movie, you know, and, and it, it's set on Antarctica, so it makes a lot of sense, and, and that was very deliberately chosen, you know, it's, yeah, this, there's a, there's a lot more, like, you know, overall, like there's a there's a certain, you know, to be clear, the the 
you know, mentioned that you have these abandoned refineries, you have military bunkers, and the the wasteland in between them, but it never feels like they're just walking down the same set from multiple scenes. You know, that's that's the thing you absolutely want to avoid for something like this, because it'll immediately just then then the audience just can't care because at the end of the day like every time we see a new place and people are still walking between places like it tells us wow there's a lot of distance to walk here but if we see a place and it's like that's the same place as before you know then then you lost it then then you can't maintain the illusion anymore and this always maintains that illusion it never feels like oh well, that's the same place you know they go to more than one like inside location over the course of this and there are certainly some similarities because you know refinery it's not like people don't live there it's not it's not a there's not like pleasant furniture or whatever you know there might be like an area that they eat lunch in or whatever but yeah you know so they have that kind of sparse minimalistic quality that you know the the corporation or and the military they're not going to spend any more money than they absolutely have to you know they they have all this you know the company has all this profit to make and the military have you know they they they're fighting a war so so you know this these kinds of not not to be making any excuses for military spending which is completely out of control in America but the the yeah you know they manage to make these places distinct yet feel like they belong in the same overall universe and yeah they they do a pretty good job stretching the budget to to fit that now but but yeah and and the the you know this does also manage this thing of you know a lot of the time it's paranoia it's anxiety and it's the crushing weight of this seemingly endless war and and just basically like you know people talk about i don't know if i'm ever going to go back home i don't even know if i like it if i tried to go back home you know the, the, it has broken a lot of these people th this war has you know so obviously if you had like bright colors and and you know or people were in a really good mood it wouldn't fit it would break the the immersion and yeah, they managed to never let that happen, but also not let it... The, the movie's never boring. And let's see... Yeah, so, some more critic quotes. Plenty of good, albeit derivative, ideas and evident potential clash with contrived concepts, inconsistent pacing, and last-minute designs. The cheap B-movie version of better sci-fi movies with a few things about it to like and a lot of things you just have to tolerate. I, I wouldn't go quite that far. Let's see. The ensuing Darwinian struggle combines space opera skirmishes and Cold War paranoia, although the character's dialogue involves the kind of tough guy gal posturing over familiar from the sort of 80s action movie this was in fact supposed to be. Superior sci-fi action drama successfully translates Fokadik's dark imagination into a suspenseful and atmospheric thriller. Enjoyable movie, interesting to the end. Plenty of action in an off-earth setting with some twists and Peter Weller. The first two acts work, work, build tension, keep you interested, then it all falls apart and you are left with ridiculousness. The, the ending is definitely my least favorite thing about this movie, and I will get into it. Not in spoilers, in the review itself, of course. Better than Road Warrior and Blade Runner, it's not a masterpiece like Alien, but close. I don't know if that guy and I watched the same Blade Runner. Uh, I don't know if it's been a long time. Wait, wait, Road Warrior? Is that the first one? Is that the second one? I think Road Warrior is the second one. I, I only watched the first Mad Max. I know, I know I should watch more, but that first movie, woof. Holy crap, that really took a lot out of me. Maybe I will at some point. I mean, I like Tina Turner. Um, I think that... You know, some I've seen clips of the second. It seems like there's a. I I do really really am, admire. Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I this this will not stand. Mad Max. 
director was George Miller. I really, really admire him. I don't know that I've actually seen that many of the things he's made. Um, ooh, right. Uh, yeah, probably the thing... Okay, yeah. The segment Nightmare at 20,000 Feet of the Twilight Zone, the movie, you know, with the... Uh, hold on, it should be here, but maybe not. I will instead of the the Captain Kirk actor, the role. Huh. I mean, it's got to be here somewhere. Um, John Lithgow plays the role in that, and the we the Witches of Eastwick also. Yeah, and apparently, like, you know, I I remember someone mentioning this, like, he, he, you know, he made the first three Mad Max movies, and then he made, like, Babe, Pig in the City, Happy Feet, Happy Feet 2, and then he went back and made Mad Max Fury Road. That's, that's kind of cool, that he would, like, yeah. I mean, I guess they needed him to prove that he could make them a lot of money. I feel like those weren't the... Let's see, Bay Pig in the City, Happy Feet 1 and 2. I feel like the I heard those made a lot of money. Anyway, let's see. A few plot holes. With the budget they had, it looks great in the visual department. The acting is above average. Peter Weller is more or less carrying the whole movie from start to finish. And this guy says, I wish they would make a prequel to this movie that explained more about the situation leading up to the Screamers. If you like science fiction, this is a must say. I, I don't know if I think that... Certainly not feature length. Maybe like a short film could could work, but yeah, I I think that the inter the most interesting stuff that happens with the screamers happens in in this story, not necessarily as a movie, this version of it, but yeah. Standard stuff. Any sci-fi horror buff will have seen it before in better films. There's some truth to that for sure. Weller makes this watchable and entertaining for the most part. Some of the performances of others and some of the effects. Yeah, are kind of weak, but there's enough decent action. The sound design of the Screamers are pretty effective. Some some say that the effects are pretty dodgy, pretty terrible. I don't know. I, I really did. I would argue that at least half, maybe two-thirds of the effects are still quite good. They they were as good as they could deliver at that time. This is not one of those movies that has like endless CG, even though it didn't look convincing, because that was a big problem in the 90s. I remember I was there. This is there there is some, but it's not it doesn't get to take over the movie the way that uh, like seriously, if you if you haven't already I mean, it's not good, but I think if, if you know if you if you have a lot of spare time and you don't feel like you'd be wasting it on this, I would almost say it's it's almost worth at least once watching the two, especially the second. Uh, what are, what are they called again? A Lawnmower Man movies. That really is like. Holy crap, they just thought that this effects are never going to get any better, so let's just put them on full display. Now, let's see. Yeah, and this guy says, because it's the future, everything has colored laser beams. Seems like an odd amalgamation of pitch black Alien 3 and Terminator, which may be awesome separately, don't work when blended together. The, yeah, yeah, there is some, some truth to that. And he feels too much of it is them walking around on an alien planet, not much happening. They tried, but there was better before and after. Let's see. We've seen a lot of this before. The crumbling industrial complexes, the near anarchic survivors, the, uh, let's see, the lone woman, object, object of desire and competition. The men are either real men, beer swigging foul mouth, foul mouthed grunts, or the high strung powder kegs with telltale nerves twitches, guaranteed to keep the mosquitoes from landing. 
The exception, of course, is Captain Joe Hendrickson, played by straight-faced Peter Weller. Isn't he always straight-faced? Anyway, a no-nonsense thinking man soldier toughened by the rigors of war. It's his job to lead his little group to safety despite the familiarity. The production design is good with believable sets, functional special effects, and a realistic look that has the dingy beat-up equipment that you would expect from a working outfit. No shiny laser pistols in this crowd. With a screenplay co-written by Dan O'Bannon, Screamers carries much of the brooding paranoia that he managed to evoke so well in the original Alien. Like so much of this Armageddon-themed sci-fi, the story has a bleakness that dares you to care about any given character because you know they are likely going to get the axe in the least expected moment. Now, let's see... I think I will put that with the spoilers. And the movie just screams, pun intended, 90s sci-fi. It is at the fringe of being high-tech, but fortunately isn't loaded with tons of bad computer-generated graphics. The stop-motion screamers are kind of fun. Let's see... With obvious nods to Aliens and Blade Runner with its themes of soldiers against an enemy they don't really understand and a paranoid sense of not knowing who is who, Screamers is a movie that has ideas and wants to be seen as being as intelligent as the films it pays homage to, but despite the best attempts of the cast to take it seriously, the limitations presented by the budget and the cliched writing sap a lot of life out of it. However, when it does get going, Screamers gets to be quite enjoyable, although it never really keeps that momentum going coming in fits and starts and throwing you red herrings until the frustrating and obvious climax. <clears throat> Despite taking inspiration from Dick's short story, it favors schlock and twists over moody existentialism. The special effects are almost all analog with matte and stop motion effects that were a bit outdated in 1995. There's some truth to that. But I would definitely say, you know, the they don't rest the camera on stop motion too long. You know, the important thing is to intercut it with other stuff. That's, you know, that's the secret to any special effect that doesn't hold up if you look at it for too long. Just intercut it with your action shots. And I felt like they did a good job here. And the, the matte paintings were very, very effective. Like... I could tell because I'm I'm very very I've seen I don't know maybe a hundred movies with matte painting so at this point you know I can I can recognize it when I see it but it looks really good and if you're not looking carefully for it yeah let's see only major problem with screamers is that it lasts about twenty minutes too long there were three bleh, yeah yeah the the right um. Let's see. I th think I will put that. Um, hmm. Let's see. Um, did I not? Oh, here we go. Yeah. There. Um, Sometimes competency is a bad thing. Screamers is a fairly well made Duguay, fairly well made. Duguay's composition is spectacular, mostly because the sets were all CG embellished, so there was only so much he was actually shooting. That is true, and you can kind of tell that he's he's constrained by that. But there are some excellent effect sequences. There's some nice stop motion. Duguay knows how to spend his limited budget to make the film look good. Very very true. And let's see. in the future, the Mining Planet Series 6B has become a war zone with two warring factions. The ground is patrolled by underground robots called Screamers who target anyone not wearing identifying marks. One side receives a plea for peace negotiations after 10 years of war. <coughs> Commander Hendrickson sets out with a lost soldier to Jefferson to contact. contact the other side and declare peace. 
However, what they find will spell, um, will, yeah, will spell, spell the end of their war one way or another. This is based on a Philip K. Dick story and has all the intelligence you would expect from a sci-fi from him. Not a gory horror movie, an intelligent story about the creation of Screamers and their evolution. Let's see. Right. The, I'm going to make sure to put that there. And All in all, Screamers is a very good look at man's weapons gone awry. The Screamers are just more mobile landmines of today, still around long after their purpose is long past. That's an excellent, yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's absolutely true. That's a, yeah. This I found fascinating. So one, one user review said, One thing I did not understand was why this movie was so savaged by the Hollywood film critics. Perhaps because it was made in Canada. I never heard. Can you can you put in the comments if like, like I I get I know that like you know, school kids don't uh, American school kids think Canada is lesser than America. I've never heard of like a movie from Canada getting less critical appraisal because it was made in Canada. I mean I mean it it went to theaters in America, so it's not like no one in America watched it. Yeah, I I don't know. Anyway. Let's see. Trust has always been a fundamental problem throughout the years because by its nature it's never been a solid foundation to begin with. Despite the length of time we spend with a person, we never truly know them from his or her past to even what they do when we're not around them. Most importantly, I really like the suspense where you are on constant edge and as a steady build because you're never sure what you'll discover. When you do, it might be too late. And... Yeah, that's an excellent point, but it's also a spoiler, so I'm putting it in the spoiler section. There we go. Postmortem Philip K. Dick doesn't get much love from script writers, and the story's second variety is no exception. For someone who's so cerebrally metaphysical, movie based movies based on his novels tend to take an action turn. For the worst, dissolving the underlying essence of his stories and frontally assaulting with visual high octane spectacles. Screamers is a low-budget take on the latter, albeit with some undeniable atmosphere to back it up. And... Let's see... I suppose... The, yeah. The special effects would have been groundbreaking for the 80s, but by 1995 they feel dated. The B-movie cast is headlined by Peter Weller. While I have few complaints about the acting, an A-list would have been much more impactful. Screamers, a Philip K. Dick-inspired short story, morphed into a film a little ahead of the time. So much with the gore CGI and the sets that rivals Starship Troopers. Let's see. It's great if you like sci-fi and military conflicts, just like Dune or the Command and Conquer video game series. Look no further. That is very true. Like, the... Uh, yeah. Tiberian Sun has, like, live-action FMV. If you know what that stands for, <sighs> pat yourself on the back and try not to feel old. Full motion video. And the, the, um, yeah, the tone of that, and the tone of this movie, there's a lot there that's, yeah. The male protagonist has a very sarcastic and dry humor, but tough and rugged like Eastwood or even Howard. He's paired with a new grunt infantry cadet, and his he's, of course, the comic relief. He looks like a baby Joe Bernthal. Yeah, yeah, that's... Rutger Hauer in this role would have nailed it, IMHO, although Peter Weller did an amazing job in the view of being a comic book adaptation or a graphic novel. It was let down in two areas. For most of the film, the effects were very cheap, contrasting with the quality of the rest of it. Two, they lent 
a little too much on the cheap thriller aspect and parts of it, especially at the very end, detracted a little from the intelligent themes and great acting. It's almost as if there were two competing forces at work. Highly com competent professional pro A-list filmmakers versus some strange incompetent critic who badly wanted it to be a B-film. So it was flawed. The effects and scenery are amazing, though at the end it is obvious that the budget ran out. This won't go down in history as the next alien, but blessed Screamers does try. The early parts that set up the basic plot background will seem a bit too talky and vague for some viewers. It is a bit tricky to get into, but a pretty clever, if done to death, concept is established quite well. But alas, there are some flaws in there as well. It is never established. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's. Um. The storyline doesn't quite deliver as much as it promised. And some of the characters that are introduced later in the film never really develop into anything more than boring and annoying stereotypes that just clutter the film. But this doesn't ruin the movie, and it remains enjoyable to watch. Give it a look, and you might just grow very fond of this film. And... Yeah, so the opening does a really great job setting up the tone for the rest of the movie and establishing setting and stakes. So I won't give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending does mostly fit what came before. I don't think the ending is good, and I, I think that is really frustrating because so easily it could have been. Um, essentially... I'm not going to detail it, but essentially if you removed a little of what is there in the ending now, you'd have a great ending. So just, yeah, I, I, it feels like they, it feels like they had a set ending, but then someone lost faith in it and they decided to add more instead of change what they had. And now it just kind of feels weird. Anyway. And a number of critics, a number of reviews also do not like the ending. And yeah, so the I I recommend reading or listening through the original short story. There is a free version here on legal free here on YouTube. It's the story is apparently in the public domain. You know, I, I read it once, uh, wow, by now, I guess, seven years ago, and I listened through the, the book a couple of days ago, and I would definitely say the original is worth checking out if you like this adaptation, and vice versa, and let's see, I suppose, yeah, that is... Kind of, a, so I put that here. But yeah, you know they do like. Unfortunately, some of the characters are not allowed to be full people in the movie. I don't know why. Uh, the the, but the the concepts are largely kept intact. And yeah, I mentioned that they take some stuff that. The book just, you know, it's not, I don't think it's even really the protagonist thinking about these things. It's just, it's just coming out. You know, it's it's well written, but, you know, in a book you can do that. In the movie it becomes dialogue, and it is a little annoying that, like, it felt like they were worried that people would notice that there's a lot of expo expository dialogue, so every so often... You know the the Peter Weller character Joe will, you know, yeah, he'll he'll be explaining a couple of line. He'll he'll deliver a couple of lines that explain to Jefferson, and maybe Jefferson says, "Wow, is that really the? Is that how it was?" And then Joe will be like, "What? Don't you understand? Like, is, is this really confrontational?" And and it just. It feels like they were worried that the audience would realize that we're having stuff just explained to us and get 
fidgety and they added that and it just feels kind of awkward. I think it would have played fine if he just explained it, but yeah. Anyway, Peter Weller stars as Commander Joseph A. Hendrickson. So, yeah, we, we catch him here after the Dead or Alive, You're Coming With Me, and Mugwumpjism, but before Star Trek, Dexter, and Star Trek again. Dude really loves trekking into the stars. And, yeah, you know, I joked earlier, isn't he always very you know, straight-faced kind of, I really admire him. I think he is phenomenal in the first RoboCop movie. Like, that that movie, there's a lot of things in that movie that need the exact right treatment for it to work, and his performance is one of them. There's so many people who would not have been able to deliver, and he delivers both when he's supposed to be just machine and also when there's more emotion there. Jennifer Rubin plays Jessica Hansen, and she does a, a good job feeling like, you know, the, the moment that you have a um, woman in the midst of this kind of military and, you know, like, if, if you're on this, if you're on Sirius 6B, you are military or a minor, which means you can't drink. And obviously, if you place a woman in there, it's gonna be like, okay, you know, not, shit, now I'm sounding like a misogynist. I'm just saying, you you would expect her to be hardened as well, because people aren't going to take, you know, people aren't gonna have any patience for her if she is traditionally feminine. And, yeah, you know, the the she does a really good job. It feels like she's been stuck for years on this planet where just, you know, there's there's war and there's mining and nothing else and just, yeah. And yeah, Andrew Lauer does well as Private Michael Ace Jefferson, uh, you know, um, I felt like they made him a little too chatty, but, you know, it it's, the, the thing that's, it works well that he is, uh, let's see, everybody. yeah, so, you know, most of the characters have been in the war for a long time and are battle-hardened, and this is further underlined in contrast with this fresh recruit who is much more casual, you know, he's still in the military, but, yeah, he's not this, like, yeah, so, so you know, that helps to really underline that without him feeling out of place. You know, another character says, you just got out of the academy, so you think you're hot shit. You think you're gonna save the world. You know, and... Yeah, the... the Right, also... Um, misplaced a note here, but yeah. The action is not frenetically edited, MTV edited, the way that a lot of 90s action movies, maybe especially sci-fi, were. So that's also really quite a relief. And let's see. Yeah, the the honestly, the rest of these. Um, yeah, the okay. So Ron White as Lieutenant Commander Chuck Elbarak, Charles Powell's Private Ross, Roy Dupuy as Private Becker, Michael Callows as. I suppose maybe I don't want to give away what exactly he what what named character he plays, but I'll just say I had very high expectations, and he did a really solid job. Um, really, very very impressed with Michael Kalosh, who. Yeah, he did. He has edited since this. I'm glad. I was a little... I, I don't think I've... Yeah, I don't really... Oh, he's he's in the quest. But as... Okay, his character has a, has a number after it. So, yeah, no, I don't remember. I remember the quest. I don't remember that particular character. But, yeah, he... Okay, so he... Yeah, he kept acting until 1999. And, yeah, 
Um, I um, he was in some episodes of Goosebumps. Anyway, um, Liliana Kamarowska plays Private Landowska. Now she plays the campy OTT villain of Scanners Three, but her form her performance in Hitler: The Rise of Evil and elsewhere much more subdued. So she is capable of that, and here she is much more subdued. You know it it. I, I don't know if I will ever... The fact that, like... I can't unsee it now. You know, no, I've, I, I'd seen her in other stuff before, but now I can't unsee the, the goofy faces she pulls in Scanners 3. But, yeah, I mean, she's in... She's in a bunch of, of things that... I've seen some of her other things and just didn't really think much about the character she played but she she is married to director Christian Duguay so the fact that she appears in a number of his movies you know might at first appear to be you know like I mean I suppose arguably it is nepotism but it's he's not putting her there despite her not being very good and the performance that she gives in scanners 3 is exactly what that that role required and that that movie would be very like it it wouldn't be that interesting without her let's see but but yeah the yeah, she's been in several other things that he has directed. And it's also, like, she's not in much of Hitler, The Rise of Evil. So, you know, he doesn't put her front and center if it's not, if, if there isn't room for that. Jason Cavalier plays Private Leon. Lenny Parker, Corporate McDonnell, and Bruce Boa plays... Secretary Green. And that brings... So yeah, the dialogue I already mentioned. You know, ex exposition... By and large, the exposition in this is not people telling each other things that they already know. It tends to be, you know, something new. They're, they're explaining something to uh, someone who doesn't already know it. But yeah, the the um, I I I wish they didn't do all the tough guy speak. You know, it, it especially stands in stark contrast. Like like I said, just yesterday I watched the thing 1982, where you know there is also a paranoid situation, and it's also this thing of you know they've been stuck doing the same thing for a very long time now. In that movie, they're scientists, not soldiers. But even so, like. I, I really wish that it wasn't all these. Like, honestly, if you get bored watching this, you could make a drinking game out of every single time someone says something that either verbatim or at least, like, you've heard similar in other, you know, it's, it's, It's like it's like in in the original Predator movie, you know. And one of the things that works really well about that movie is that there's not those lines throughout the entire movie. Now, I won't give away exactly why that is, but you know, there's contrast there where in this movie not not that much, you know, some of the first lines are these kinds of tough guy and yeah, throughout a lot of the movie. Now, that brings us to the cinematography, which was handled by Rodney Gibbons. Now, Gibbons oh, has directed 17 things, but some of this is TV show episodes, TV movies, and I don't think I know if... Oh, he directed some episodes of Lassie. I think that's the only thing I've heard of that he's directed. He wrote four things, but yeah, he has 22 cinematography 
Oh, he may have actually DP'd some of the episodes he directed. He certainly DP'd some episodes of Lassie. Maybe that's why he eventually got to direct some episodes as well. But yeah, um, he has worked with... He also DP'd Scanners 2. So the two of them worked together, he and the director. Although this does seem like this is... These are the two only things where they work together. He DP'd the original My Bloody Valentine. But, but yeah, so, you know, he has a lot of skill in the... He, he knows what he's doing, again, genre-wise. Now, the... Especially the... Um, yeah, I already mentioned, the, there's some really excellent lighting and some shots that are like at a distance where like the the people are small in the image and walking across the the image and in the background you see these massive refineries and such and that helps to really add scope and again you know looking at it okay that's matte painting but it's you know it still works that brings us to the editing, which was handled by Yves Langlois, and that is a very French name. Let's see. Oh, he actually is from France. I was about to say they do have a lot of French names in Canada, but he actually is from France. He has edited 102 different things and he is edi he edited some stuff just last year and let's see yeah so some of his early stuff is french oh he edited quest for fire amazing job on that one the editing is extremely important to that movie and let's see yeah scanners to the New Order, Scanners 3, The Takeover. Yeah, the so so they work together on multiple things, he and the director, and yeah, you know, that tends to suggest that, you know, if the director keeps working with the same editor and cinematographer and that kind of thing, it means he's getting what he wants from them. You know, it might be difficult for him to fire them while working on the one movie if he ends up displeased, but he's not going to bring him back if if he has a choice in the matter. But yeah, um, really good job. They they do a you know the the effects like I mentioned really need to be intercut with reaction shots and like in in general you have to cut away from the effect pretty quickly before the audience, before our eye pieces together, that's not real. And they do a really good job of doing that without getting into the MTV editing. Now, yeah, you know, good both shot-to-shot -shot momentary editing, good scene-to-scene -scene structural editing, and Right, that brings us to the filming. Yeah, uh, this was all filmed in Quebec, and yeah, you know, there's not I, I'm there's not a lot of location shooting in this. You know, it's it's possible that they went to location and then like set up green screen to get them tromping through this. You know, some some of it's snow, some of it's like sand or ash and such. But other than that, it's not location. It's, you know, yeah, it's not as much location work. And I think that was the right choice. And the action is good. I, I wouldn't really call it an action movie. It is it's a horror movie with some action in it horror thriller 
and but but the action there is is legitimately tense, suspenseful, and exciting. And that brings us to the music, which was handled by Norman Corbeil, R.I.P. In his life, he composed for 63 movies. And yeah, and and worked with the director. Right, he did the music for Boot Camp. I think he did a very good job there. And here as well, and, and human trafficking. So yeah. Hitler, the Rise of Evil. They they had a good working relationship. The Art of War. Yeah. Um yeah, it's the, the music is good. The the it it's good for the, the tension when that's what's needed and you know when when it's like there are scenes it's it's not like constantly trying to to be incredibly intense sometimes people are just talking and it's not like threatening and such and for that the music isn't like over the top and trying to yeah there's some really excellent sound design such as for the screamers themselves which is critical because the screamers are special effects in real life so we're not going to buy it if they don't make a if, if the noises that they make don't feel like it's like there's really something there making that noise and also so that like you know the screamers are essentially the reason we're watching the movie you know I'm, I'm sure some people hopped in just for Peter Weller but you know the the core concept it's in the title you know and and you know Philip K Dick in the short story also made them deeply memorable but he of course couldn't add sound so making the you know yeah it's it's a really good you know basically this is the kind of movie where you want people to say you have to watch the movie the screamers sound terrifying and they do and yeah um the pacing you know one critic said it's somewhat inconsistent it's not really like bad pacing at at any point i would argue i i was never really like bored but i st yeah there is some inconsistency to it now, without end credits, the movie is an hour and 40 and a half minutes. With credits, it's an hour and 44 minutes. And I would say if you watch the first 40 minutes, the, the, um, yeah, you know, it should, you should basically have um, a grip on whether or not you'll want to keep watching if, if at that point it has not gotten your interest, you know, if you're watching by yourself and no one will be upset by you stopping watching, yeah, you might as well stop watching. It's not really going to do anything new that's going to completely change the way you... Yeah, so that brings us to the best element of the film is seeing an excellent Philip K. Dick story as a film and how well they do capture the paranoia and the kind of like the the concept which I realize I've been playing coy about I I will talk about it when I get into the spoilers I'm just I don't really want you to know until you start what un, until you get to the point in the movie where it's revealed yeah um, they they actually do capture how the the core concept just like it completely changes you know Philip K. Dick big fan of that big fan of stories where there is at least one concept that completely changes the way we see the world and yeah um, they they did do a good not amazing job bringing that out the worst aspect is almost definitely the B movie genre stuff, the the dialogue and some stuff with writing and and yeah. Now 
let's see. So yeah, the the thing I saw, something I saw a number of other reviewers say that they really hated about it were the effects and them being dated for the 90s. And I just realized that I did not talk at all about the budget. Did I accidentally? Anyway, I will try to briefly get into it now. Yes, the budget was $20 million, which for 95 was not a huge amount considering that it's literally set. And, like, they have to, everything has to be created for the movie, you know. Sets, clothes, or costumes, sets, costumes, props, all these effects, you know, you can't just find a place and film it there, you know, to, to save some money, I mean. And the worldwide gross was apparently only five million, so it was quite the failure at the box office. I'm glad it didn't ruin uh, Christian Duguay's career. Yeah, the thing I was most worried about was definitely that they would screw up Philip K. Dick the way that they did with stuff like Next and Paycheck, Total Recall, Total Recall 2012, but yeah, um, this, actually I suppose I will say whether or not, it, I'll get to the ranking very, very soon. The thing I was most looking forward to was Dan O'Bannon's script, and the movie did largely exceed my expectations. The trailers and cover do give too much away. The, the trailer definitely does give you a good idea of what the movie is like, but yeah, gives a little, a little too much away, and if you have already seen the cover or poster, try not to think too much about what I, I don't... I'd like to have a word with the people who like putting stuff on posters that's a spoiler if you realize what you're looking at. That's that's a bad idea. Just Just don't do that. And... Yes, that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes where it has a 29% on the tomato meter, a 45% on the audience score. It does not even have a critic's consensus. Of the 35 reviews, only 10 of them are fresh. The average rating is 4.60 out of 10. And the average audience score, the f over 5,000 ratings, you know, largely gave it 3.1 out of 5. Anything under 3.5 is a, a down wo vote, a thumbs down in the... So, yeah, you know, 55% of the people who voted for it gave it a down vote. So that's... yeah. And it says, if you like this movie, you might like Leprechaun 4 in Space, Python, The Glimmer Man, Ghost Shark, and The Foreigner. The Glimmer Man and the Foreigner are both late stage Seagal movies, so that's. Yeah. The, and it's it's very rare for me these days to, to do a video on something that is rotten on Rotten Tomatoes, but, you know, I, I really love the short story and I found a great deal on it. It's not on Metacritic at all. Nobody, it's just not there at all. It was nominated for three Genie Awards, but apparently lost all three. Ron White was nominated for Best Performance as Actor in Supporting Role. Perry Gorara for Best Achievement in Art Direction and Production Design. That I definitely do understand. That makes a lot of sense. And Norman Corbale for the Best Achievement in Music Original Score. And the IMDb, it has a 6.3 out of 10 based on 28,000 votes. 26.1% of them gave it a 7. 25.0% gave it a 6. 13.7% gave it an 8. 
12.5 gave it 5, 6.5 gave it 10, 5.6 uh, gave it 4, 4.7 gave it 9. I'm not sure I see how you would give this less than a 4, but okay. 2.7 gave it 3, 1.7 gave it 1, 1.5 gave it 2. I can't help but wonder if some of those are maybe from people who you know, maybe they read the short story and they were really disappointed. Maybe they saw other people comparing it to Alien and were very disappointed. You know, that kind of thing. Now, let's see. So that, um, but yeah, those votes do make a lot of sense. And there we go. There it is. And yeah, so I've already talked some about the special effects. Uh, let's see, is there much left to say? <clears throat> I would definitely say that the effects tend to serve the story and atmosphere rather than distract. And yeah, and there are some really excellent stunts. So yeah, this is not a hugely gory movie, but the gore that there is, a lot of it is quite good, very effective. And... Let's see... Yeah, so I will be put a couple of links in the description box to... There we go. Reviews and such that I think are worth sharing. Now, my DVD is fairly bare bones. There is a two minute theatrical trailer for the movie, a minute, one minute DVD the, the trailer for the medium of DVDs. And I think they also like wrote some stuff about the cast and crew, but yeah, you know, minimal kind of it doesn't have like and and I do get that this is not the kind of movie that it it wasn't a it wasn't a success if we're talking about like the um it's it's not it wasn't a success financially it wasn't really a success like culturally so they didn't want to necessarily go back and, and redo. It's possible that there are bigger DVDs out there. I, I just went for the cheapest I could find. Anyway, yes, I rank this seven killer robots out of ten. And I think that does put it... Yeah, so an updated, you know, ranked... Let's see. Yeah, ranked worst to best. These are all the Philip K. Dick movie adaptations I've watched, and the the first the the bottom five are you know I don't love them. The rest the all above that I do love. So next paycheck total recall 2020 20, 12 rather. Screamers, Minority Report, 2002, not the TV show, I mean, Blade Runner 1, Total Recall, 1990, The Adjustment Bureau, Scanner Darkly, and Blade Runner, 2049. And the Christian Duguay movies, Ranked Worst to Best, again, I enjoy all of them, you know, I, I don't quite love any of them, but none of them are unenjoyable, in my opinion. Scanners to the New Order, Live Wire, Scanners 3, The Takeover, Screamers, Boot Camp, Human Trafficking, and Hitler, The Rise of Evil. And that brings us to the spoiler section. So from here on out, I am spoiling the movie itself in its entirety, as well as the short story. And let's dive right into notes taken while watching. So I really like that the first bit of human movement you see is a foot sinking into ash. That's, you know, I think that is also the first thing 
noted about the person who runs at them at the start of the, the book. And we see that cigarettes are basically a form of currency. You know, they're, they're not betting money, they're betting cigarettes, which again tells you so much about the situation. What do they have to spend money on? There's nothing to do. But cigarettes, that can make the pain go away a little, just, just briefly, you know. I guess I will just briefly say, it's, you know, it's been a couple of days, so I have forgotten some stuff, but the short story, from what I recall, like the base at the start of this movie, I don't, as, I don't think it's as full of people, at least. I think there's only a few people. And Jefferson isn't in the book at all. Uh, you know, but if he wasn't there, then, you know, what? who is Joe going to talk to? He doesn't, it doesn't make sense for him to explain to David. David has experienced the war, you know. And I think they did remove some of David's lines, but... They might have felt like it got too, it ended up being too obvious. And they do have some of the most important ones. So five minutes into the movie, we get the, you better come take a look at this. I mean, they got there eventually. And like the book, it opens on the screamers, you know, that are burrowed. I guess, I guess I'll call them autonomous swords, since Screamer, by the end of the movie, also includes the, the ones that look human. But yeah, so, the autonomous swords, you know what, I'm gonna be calling them claws, like in the, in the short story that rolls off the tongue. The, the claws kill the guy. Now, in the book, it is very, like, I guess it doesn't go into, like, explicit detail, but what it describes is basically that, like, the guy was, you know, sawed into tiny little pieces. Like, just, there's nothing left of him, basically, where, you know, they, they couldn't get away with that. And maybe today. I think today, both effects-wise and, like, I've seen R-rated movies that have stuff like that in them today. But in 95, especially on that budget, just not gonna happen. And some of the troops being disgusted by the claw kills. I think that's also in the in the short story. And the, yeah, and the thing about you know even years later, still can't get used to something so inhuman. And you know the screw the 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 claws is like what this is Tuesday, you know. And I like that the movie visually demonstrates the wristband, which that that stops claws, you know, in, in the book, it's basically just, you know, I know that I'm okay because I have the wristband kind of thing, you know, it works in the book, but yeah, you, you need a visual for, for a movie to make it more visually appealing. Now, and, and the peace negotiation, you know, immediately it's like, can, can we trust, are they trying to lure us into a trap? And why was there only one guy, you know, and that immediately, and I don't, yeah, I don't think that's in the, in the actual movie, but in the short story, like, the reason that there's, like, you know, two guys left from the other is that they were, you know, they were having sex, I, I don't know, if at the same time or whatever, but, you know, they went to have sex with, I, I'll use the movie's names, Jessica. And that was the only reason they weren't in the bunker when it happened. You know, which is especially ironic, bitterly ironic, when you realize that she is one of them. She's just not, she doesn't kill you right away. She waits until she's gotten, you know, she, she has bigger things in mind than just killing the person she runs into. Same as how the, you know, David tags along kills everyone in the bunker once she get once he gets in Jessica she gets into the robot the rocket in the short story and yeah but the the yeah you know in the 
No, I guess, yeah, I guess it does come across in the movie as well. The reason there was only one guy for peace negotiations is that everyone else is dead. You know, why did he alone on foot? Everyone else was dead. You know, he couldn't, he, he had no one else alive to bring with him. You know, the only people left alive were Jessica and the two guys, and he didn't know about them. He, you know, so that's, uh, and I, I like the detail about how, you know, you know he, he holds up the thing, and it's like, I mean, if he throws it, they're going to think it's a grenade. So he, cut, you know, he doesn't really have much. But at the same time, you know, it does. I, I will admit, I don't know quite why it was. Like, you know, it, it finally opened when he pretended he was going to smash it against the his metal desk. Then it opened, were, were they, like, hoping that someone would pull that prank? I don't know. I guess it's probably supposed to be that the moment, like, it recognizes his DNA as, a, as the officer, something like that. I like the detail about the glitch in the hologram and how, you know, nobody acted like it was hologram until there was a glitch. Because to them, it's like, you know... When you've seen a hologram 10,000 times, you're not going to point and say, look, it's a hologram, just in case there's a fourth wall audience watching you, you know, so that detail that he's not, gonna, he's not even going to show up in person to, to tell them this, you know, he's just going to send it over the glitchy hologram, thing, you know. And I really love the detail that the reason the war is ending is because they found a new source of the resource that was being fought over. See, that is very, that's Dan O'Bannon's detail. And that's again, you know, that's not in the short story because in the short story, it's just that, well, you know, one side has basically won. So, you know, and, and then they keep, do they even keep fighting? You know, the, I, I forget, but there's stuff, there's not anything about resources there. So, and, and again, I think Philip K. Dick would have appreciated this change. You know, he actually, he didn't live to see the end of the Cold War. And, but, but yeah, that's very true to life and great detail. I really love, you know, so many Hollywood movies. It's like the war is over because that one person was killed and it's so good that we had that one guy on the on the good side who's just so good that nobody else can hit him, you know. And and here it's like no, that's not how war ends. Wars end when the resource, you know, either one side makes a decisive victory, or they find an, the resource they want someplace else, you know. And I like that they're fighting radiation with cigarettes, which I I don't think that was in the. Was that in the short story? I, I forget, but the definitely there were there was a lot of cigarette smoking in the in the short story. Jessica keeps asking for cigarettes, and he doesn't run out right away like he does here. He keeps giving her cigarettes, which is also such a great like, you know, why would a robot? What, you know, what would God need with a starship? And what would a robot need with a cigarette? So it just immediately you think you it, it it you're not consciously thinking she must not be a robot, but it's just. You lower your guard. You know, you can trust someone if you can have a smoke with them. I assume. I've never smoked. And the the crash with the one survivor, also new to film, but the short story, not a huge amount happens. And, like, they had to, they had to add a little more to make it feel, you know, it, they had to get it to, to feature length. If you just did the short story as is, I think it would only be a half, about half a movie, and yeah, you know, I, I feel like they did a good job adding little things, and we see that the claws are modifying themselves, and yeah, you know, the this ship was sent to attack Triton 4, they're already going to, you know, they haven't even told the, the, the people on Series 6B, you know, and, and Jeff points out, Jefferson points out, Green has been gone for two years, you know, they're, they've been left behind. 
I like the detail that sometimes the wristband malfunctions because of radiation, which I don't think is in the short story, but that's a good way to get in a little tension again. And the, you know, the attack along the way because he takes the wristband off, that's also not in the book, and it's the kind of thing, you know, they add it because they're a little worried that some of the audience might start to fall asleep if something doesn't happen other than people walking very, very soon, you know. And so I'm, I'm okay with that addition, though I do think it's a little annoying that he was stupid enough to take it off without at least asking first. I mean, why did he even take it off? It wasn't, like, constricting his movement. I get that he was, like, watching porn, but it's not like that thing was going to narc on him or something. Anyway. And... Yeah, in, in the book, it's just Joe going to the, the peace talk. Not him and someone else. And... Yeah, you know, for the the um, yeah, they they spot the boy who let's see. yeah, and and they actually you know in the in the book Joe is or yeah the Joseph equivalent. I, I'm not sure he's called Joseph, but, you know, he's he's fairly trusting, which works for the short story. I think they were maybe worried about making the lead that trusting, you know. The, the short story was written in, I want to say, 1953. You know, at the time, it was considered okay for an American lead, in, in at least a written, just short story, to be a little trusting, but by the 90s, 80s and 90s, yeah, it was probably thought of that, you know, people would think he was weak, so instead they made a Jefferson who was trusting. And he talks about cooking rats, and let's see. Yeah, and the the um, I think I want to talk a little bit about yeah. So so briefly about David, you know. So in the in the short story, I don't think they mention the in the movie, but you know, in the short story, the reason that they trust that that Joseph trusts him, trusts David, is that he figures. You know, the reason the kid doesn't talk much and looks kind of pale and such, it's because of the war. You know, he's he's basically very, very, um, I guess not, is hardened the word? He's, you know, he's more quiet than you might think. And the thing is, if you look at it in, in the, yeah, in, in both, every line David says works for, you know, once you find out that he's, a robot it's still like oh yeah I I understand why he said that you know it, there's nothing he didn't say anything where you're like why would a robot say that? you know it's it's the baseline of you know they've made something that looks like a human being and he can he has a low vocabulary but he can say a few things okay so he says can I come with you which you know that's how he gets into the bunker because you know who's going to who's going to look the the little child in the eyes and say no i don't want you you stay here in the war torn ash written bomb to shit you know no i don't you know whatever you know um in the in the short story it's a it's, you know joe reasons that the reason david doesn't eat is the Actually, hold on. I forget. Yeah, he he definitely does consider it. David in the movie, I don't think he did. Did he maybe accept the ration? And that was what it. Yeah. I. I. Anyway, let's see. He says. In uh, yeah, in the in the short story, the the you know Joe asks, you know, how many of you are you know, the the he assumes that the 
yeah, he he figures that David is living with someone, and he asks how many, and David and, and David responds, why? Because that's the tactical thing, you know. If, if your enemy is trying to figure out your precision and how many are in your forces, you don't give a straight answer, of course not. But you know, at the time, you know, it's just okay. We don't have to talk about it. You know, maybe, maybe it's a sore subject. And let's. I like the the detail that I, I know this is slightly out of order, but earlier, you know, when Joe talked about the transmissions he's going to be sending, he said that one of them will the first will be at thirty three hundred hours. So, you know, the on this the, this um, did they call it was it a moon or planet? You know, on this place there are third at least thirty three hours in the day, not twenty four. That's a good detail to just make it slightly different from Earth and in a way that is like, you know, not completely bonkers. And the VR porn, you know, it felt kind of cheap. I didn't think that it needed to go on for like several seconds. It felt like just a way to get some nudity into the film to, you know, get people to, to rent it for that, but... I, I don't hate the idea. It's it's not in the short story, but it does make sense that soldiers, and especially like he's he's new, so he, you know, it's it's a way for him to to get away from the loneliness. And it's, yeah, the. They're scanned, and as they get to the bunker, and David gets shot. David was a goddamn robot. And they, you know, the when the knife is removed, the snipes the Nero fan starts turning again. Very clever, because if you were to try to get in through that, you would have to stop the fan. And, you know, I can imagine that would be noticed inside the bunker. Maybe there's a monitor that shows if it's running or if it stops, you know. And, you know, they point guns at each other, which felt a little... I, I wish the dialogue was just better because essentially, like, you know, they they have they have hated each other for a long time. They've tried to kill each other for a long time. It makes sense that they would still be very hostile to to each other, but yeah. And and you know, some of what is said it does make a lot of sense. You know, one of them says, You guys built these things, you know, that's that can make things tense. You know, you, you kill the things that are killing. You built the things that are killing. There it is. And, yeah, you know, they talk about the command bunker, and, you know, we wonder, well, was it, you know, ah, what's it called? Did it manage to, um, you know, has it, has it been breached? And Joe tells Jefferson not to use nukes in this war. No nuke for you. And later does end up using it, and it's this thing of... I don't mind that they change things from the book, but I think this was a very... I, I really, really love this in the book, and I think it would have worked in the movie. In the movie, they don't find a... what did they call it? Pluto? Mini miniature plutonium missile, it's that Jess is carrying around this backpack, and for a while, we don't really, I th yeah, if I recall, for a while, we don't really know what it is, it's just, you know, it's a backpack, whatever, it's a soldier, soldiers carry backpacks, and when they get into a very dicey situation, she, let's see, I think she, does she maybe throw it or something like that? And it turns out to be a bomb. 
a bomb that is uniquely effective against claws, against robots, not human beings. And when the very, very end, you know, the, like, yeah, in, in both the book and the short story, we realize that Jess is a robot because another Jess shows up. But in the book, when the other Jess shows up, you know, the other one has already left the, the, in the rocket. And there, it's, you know, leaving Earth to go to the moon base, which is where the last Earth government, you know, yeah, everyone, every, every American, like, government person that's still alive is there. So, you know, the logical conclusion is that the robots win the war against humans, and because they've now started killing each other, you know, that they've, again, this bomb, uniquely effective against the, the other robots, so, you know, in his dying moments, the, the Joseph equivalent in the short story thinks to himself, they've already started killing each other. They've already started developing weapons to kill each other. And it's sort of, the, the, essentially, the claws are just the next nuke, you know. The, 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 the nukes kill everything that's not in a bunker. The claws kill everything right outside the bunker and then the Davids get and and wounded soldiers get into the bunker and kill everyone there you know that kind of thing and yeah the next level would then be someone who you know who who will get go continue going with a person until they can get into the rocket to get to the base that yeah and uh, yeah, and, and the bomb that she made is the next nuke. You know, it's, it's, he was, he was commenting on how we human beings keep creating weapons to destroy ourselves. And, you know, what if one of those weapons got a mind of its own? And I don't think that completely hits home in, in the movie, in part because of this change. I, I wish they had just kept her backpack instead of the, the Pluto replacement. You know, I maybe it was because they figured that people who read the short story would guess it if they if they left it in. And it also kind of feels like the movie is saying, you know, what are you gonna do? Eventually you're gonna need a nuke. And that's not great, especially after the Cold War has ended to be sending that message. Though I guess maybe it was in there in the script before, since the there was a script in like 81, 84, something like that. Now, let's see. Yeah, and the, yeah, in, in the book, there's also, you know, Joseph comes upon this other place where they shoot David, and there's two men and one woman, and... Yeah, in the short story as well, the woman and one of the men both turn out to have been, uh, yeah, robots, and one of the, and the male robot kills the male human saying, I thought he was a robot. Let's see. And, you know, the thing with how she can bleed, like, the you know, like a human, even though she's a robot, you know, that feels also like it's supposed to, you know, we're supposed to think, okay, she really must not be a robot, even though she was in the book. Yeah, I'll, I, I think I will just very briefly, I think, I mean, I guess they wanted a less bleak ending, and that's why, you know, I mean, the very, very end, it does still suggest, and that's, I've, it does bug me that the ending, you know, for, for one thing, why, why is there, how did a David get the, the, um, yeah, how, how did a David's teddy bear get into the, the rocket? You know, because the rocket needed activation by humans, that's why it wasn't already, you know, and, it, yeah, um, 
And if, if I recall, the, the importance of the teddy in the short story was that it was a bomb that was effective against humans. Did it move? I think it did move. I think David, like, plopped it down on the ground and it ran on the, you know, and it, it was essentially, the yeah, the way that the claws, were they also subterranean in the book? Or were they just over, I yeah, I think they were subterranean. So it's, you know, the the next of, of the, anyway. If they didn't want it to to be as bleak as the book, and, and this thing of, you know, a robot that learned to love, really, really corny, and I don't think, like, there's nothing else in the movie that's so corny. It just feels like it came out of nowhere. Like, I'll grant that there's corny stuff in the first two Terminator movies, but not all of it is late in those movies. There's some corny stuff really early on. You know, in the in the first one, Sarah, you know, gets off her moped and says, guard it for me, big buns. Like, even if you... I, it's obviously a joke. She doesn't actually believe that big buns is going to guard her moped. He is renowned for his selfishness, but that's pretty corny, you know, and the, let's see, the, the, yeah, the second one definitely has some stuff early on, you know, here, the only corny stuff is right there at the end, you know, I get it, I don't love stories where the message is just, well, you know, if you have an enemy, they're gonna destroy you no matter what. You can't lower your guard for one single solitary fucking second, or they will kill you. You know, that's not a great message to be putting out there in the universe, but I just don't feel like the, the, yeah, I, I definitely think it was pushing it too far to say love. I, I really didn't buy that the two were in love. And it does also really feel like that's trying to crib from other, you know. I, I'm not saying I. I'm not saying that there's no corniness in any Philip K. Dick. I just think this was the wrong Philip K. Dick to have corny stuff in. And the, um, let's see. I th yeah, I think it would have worked fine if they just had, the. Yes, tell you what I think. What the ending to this movie should have been, I think, as soon as the, the you know, instead of him getting into the rock, instead of him realizing that she's a robot and having two of them robots fight each other, which again feels like, oh, well, we got to have robots fighting each other. This is, you know, I don't know if I want to give away exactly what movie started that, but yeah, you know, by this point in cinema, if there was going to be humanoid robots, we'd like to see at least two of them fight. Pretty please. But I think what it should have been is she gets into the, the rocket and takes off. And I like that they kept the thing about she points out, I can't fly. And he says, no, no, it, it'll fly itself. You know, in the in the short story, there's a there's a specific code that she has to know, and he tells her because he trusts her. But, you know, as it's flying off, and he stands there thinking, you know, and he's like, the, the, let's see, yeah, he's, he's, you know, may, yeah, maybe he, he out loud says, come back for me after this, you know, not, not thinking that she'll hear it, but just like, that's, that's why he's okay with her leaving and then he turns around and he sees another one even though she just left on the you know and then you could have this thing of I mean she didn't act like a robot maybe maybe she has some sympathy for human beings and just at uh, you know and and you know Jessica the yeah the other Jessica is standing there smiling and then opens and the saws and and he's maybe he says here's hoping and then it ends because then you have the thing of maybe you have a, a robot that has sympathy for human beings and you have the the ending that 
Like it just it seems so silly for the for the teddy bear to be there at at the at then I I would have really respected if the movie if right after the teddy bear started moving he noticed it and like picked it up and and like let's see yeah and and like shot it with with some kind of anti robot gun that wouldn't damage the rocket or something you know but just to have it yeah and literally like you could just cut like once the rocket starts taking off you could just cut to credits you don't have to have the teddy bear in there you know he he like he throws something and it lands near the teddy bear just cut that part out and it's a much better movie much better ending now let's to to be clear i don't think the ending completely ruins the movie but it definitely lessens it now yeah, I, I, let's see, yeah, the, the part with the rats start, you know, that's the thing, like, if you see rats fleeing, maybe don't head in the direction that they're coming from, because that's bad news, you know, and that's, yeah, and I realize this is out of order, but I think the sponge bath might have been a, t a you know, that's, that suggests too heavily that, She's trying to get him to lower his guard, doing a sponge bath right in front of him minutes after they met. And I like that, you know, they pass, the, you know, and, and his line, God, you're beautiful. Just, yeah, and it also didn't really feel like he completely meant that. It felt like the actor wasn't that happy about that line and just delivered it without feeling like it. Anyway, they, they walk into the, the, I guess, command bunker, and there's this, like, poster that says, Return to Paradise 6B. You know, that used to be Paradise before we ruined it. You know, I, I really like that detail. And that, again, that's something Philip K. Dick, it's not in the short story, but Philip K. Dick would have appreciated that, because he definitely did think that there was a lot of destruction caused by human beings that did not need to and I like the the so the the claw using like something like USB tick and they hear the voice of David and the David's attack and we see the teeth for the first time holy crap and you know the yeah the others escape and and he stays you know Joe stays put type you know typing in what's type two uh, that was a a good kind of because it is you know he okay we know what t type one type three but what about type two and I gotta say I never did learn their names uh, one of them one of the guys points out that the other guy is always repeating get off my back you know maybe he's actually a, a robot and I will say, you know, and, and yeah, throws his knife into the, the other guy, but then there's blood on the knife, you know. In, in the book, basically, you know, suddenly, let's see, I, th I think what it is is that Joe leaves the place where <clears throat> Jess is sleeping, and he notes, yeah, and he, he sees that one of them is pointing a gun at the other and I think actually yeah I don't remember if it's before or after he shoots him but he says I heard a uh, what's it called I heard like um I heard something that sounded like an engine or something like that you know he thought he heard engine sounds from the other one you know and then he shoots him, and it turns out he was human. But then later we find out that guy was one of the robots, you know. And, yeah, in the, um, let's see, in the, uh, in the short story, the, you know, I, I yeah, I think, Maybe it's supposed to be that he knew he was a robot. That that's the thing with 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 Philip K. D. Philip K. Dick robots. Not all of them know they're robots. 
I'm not entirely sure that the guy who shot the other guy in the short story knew that he himself was a robot and the other one wasn't. You know, maybe there was like an auditory hallucination, which is something that extreme paranoia can cause. You know, maybe he did actually think he heard that, but to here have it be that the guy keeps saying the same thing over and over, you know, that does feel like it, it's in line with, because that, by then we had learned that, you know, that's what, you know, David said the same thing, had, had a, you know, small, a, a small vocabulary, and apparently the, the wounded soldier just says, help me, can't, can't say anything else. And the, let's see, the, um, um, Let's see. The um, um crap. What was the thing? The um yeah. You know it's so so. There's a you know yeah. It it felt very very logical for it to be that he kept saying the same thing over and over. <clears throat> he refused to take a drink even though offered but yeah the the um, let's see um yeah so the the um, let's yeah so the the um, then we have the um, yeah the the um, you know ev the the other guy keeps uh, quoting Shakespeare, and later we realize that he is the you know yeah he's he's one of the robots, so yeah they they you know they just. After a while, they realized, you know, this this s small vocabulary, it's not going to keep working. So, yeah, they started giving larger vocabularies to one. And, yeah, you know, there's a lot of Shakespeare quotes that you can, you know, it makes him sound like he's, you know, he spent some of all the spare time they have. Which, you know, if you've been in the military, I haven't been in the military, but something that movies don't always tell you that is true of a lot of military stuff you have a lot of waiting you know even there, there might be something happening but you're waiting you're waiting for the bombs to stop dropping so you can return fire you're waiting for recon to get back you know there's a lot of waiting this soldier chose to spend a lot of the waiting reading the you know the works of Shakespeare that makes sense you know and yeah Let's see the yeah and and Joe asks you know can you come out and they keep saying come down and he's like I am calm and you know he asks for Don and Don Giovanni and the guy says yeah this is Don Giovanni which is you know and that is a, a in in the short story he notes that the voice is so flat and lifeless maybe it's a robot and it's you know if if you if you turn that into dialogue it's not going to hit as hard as him saying wait if you know obviously there is no don giovanni in the base no one is going to you know if if there was a single human being within earshot of the radio he would say there's no don giovanni oh you're talking about your music cute no we're not robots just come on down you know but they failed the test and yeah, and they have to gun down a bunch of Davids, and I really appreciate. See, this obviously most of those are wearing masks, but every so often it'll make sure to center the actual actor, and we can very clearly see his face and his dull, lifeless eyes. And now you understand. You know that's why his eyes are like that. It's not that he's been completely broken by this war. It's that they haven't figured out how to do life, you know, eyes that are full of life yet. 
you know, so that, but yeah, every so often it'll cut to a shot and he'll be, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes he's front and center, but certainly he's in the shot and the camera will, you know, it tricks, it, it can somewhat trick your eye into thinking that the other ones look more real, which of course, like back then they could not have, in 1995, on that kind of budget at least, they could not have done realistic looking faces. There would not be any movement at all. And, but yeah, and we see them, they have to flamethrow some of them. And they use the, the Pluto. And what on earth did I write? Okay, I have no idea. Anyway, but yeah, and then the, yeah, the, the Shakespeare quoting guy gets hit and cries out, help me, twice. And I do think they did a good job of, you know, I as a viewer, the moment that they wanted me to realize, I was like, so he's the wounded soldier, you know, which in the short story, that guy is not the wounded soldier. He is a, one of the, the robots, but he's not a wounded soldier. You know, it's in, in the book, if I recall, Jess shoots him and, and says she figured out that he had to be a robot. Was it maybe because he shot the other guy? I don't remember for sure, but yeah, you know, something like that. You know, so... In the short story, there is a wounded soldier, but that's not him. But, you know, I don't hate having him turn out to, to be that, you know. So I guess that the idea is he started out a wounded soldier, but then later got turned into the Shakespeare. Yeah, see, I think, I think it would have been better if maybe... I don't hate that we see the wounded soldier, because he's not really... We don't really meet him. He's he's there. He he's walking with a bunch of Davids at the end of the short story, and and some there's also some Jess Jessicas there, you know. But he's not someone that there's conversations with. I think it would have worked better if the wounded soldier was someone who didn't have a huge vocabulary. It just feels. You know, it's, it seems like in the last third, they just kind of decided, no, 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 robots can do whatever they want, which I get, you know, by 1995, you know, changing what a machine can do is no longer a huge deal. I just feel like it takes some away. I feel that, it, I think the story works better if each variant, vi yeah, variety, variety, variant, I guess they're, because variety you can say second variety, but yeah, I'm going to go with variant. The the different variants should each have one specific thing. You know, it's fine that they have a large vocabulary, but then let them have a large vocabulary. Don't ever have them have a small vocabulary kind of thing, you know. And I got to say, the moment that they shot and, and like he got hit in the face and like he turns his head, you know, I was sitting there thinking, oh, we're going to get the cool, you know, half the face is gone Terminator shot. But then he turns back and there's just this little makeup thing. And then he spits out the bullet. And yeah, that was the thing. I'm, I'm guessing that was a thing that, you know, I, know I, I quoted a critic as saying it was obvious that they ran out of money at the end. Yeah, that was that was them running out of money. That was not something that would at all yeah and i feel like they didn't even need it because it doesn't kill him anyway just have him cut in half as happens right after you know that is the the thing that i think maybe in the in the book it was supposed to be more of the, or maybe it is supposed to be that like no even you know one of these bullets that usually is really effective it barely does any damage, but, like, it's just not a good way to, yeah. Um, you know what? If, if they had had the money and they wanted to do the thing with, oh, you know, those bullets don't even do very much damage, have it be that, like, it maybe he shoots him in the forehead and, like, you know, he his head whips away 
and and we th you know maybe he stands still for a second and we think oh he's gonna fall because he's dead and then he turns his head back and like the bullet went through but and it's like cracked some of the face and it's like really horrifying looking you know you can do a thing where the the face isn't half missing like terminator but don't do this little pockmark like the makeup was fine for what it was but it's just it's a bad idea it's not the way to do it in my opinion now let's see but but yeah it was it was cool that he got cut in half to to take him out and you know he managed to to wound um jefferson so badly that he's dying which i also appreciate you know he he throws him away but before he does that he squeezes him i was told you would be powerful because why wouldn't why would he throw him away before killing him and a robot with robot biceps can crush a human you know you don't have to crush a human very much just you know crush him enough that's a couple of um, a couple of our organs you know get squeezed too much they they pop and you know that's that's it you're gonna die really soon unless you get serious medical attention you know so yeah i really appreciate that there are way too many movies where robots will pick up a person and just throw him away instead of hurting him in a you know severe anyway jefferson no i have more exposition to deliver to you and let's See. Yeah, and and Joe cuts Jessica's hand to to make sure if she's a robot or not, and there's blood, and then they kiss because what woman wouldn't love for someone to cut her hand? Like, even if you wanted the test to be there, like just have, you know. If you had, like, Joe look at her and be like, are you human? You know, and, and then, you know, maybe, maybe he's like, I can't, I can't trust you anymore. Like, back away or, like, try to go on without her or something. And she won't let him, so she cuts her hand or something. You know, but him cutting her hand and then immediately after they kiss, just like, yeah. Have you, have you met a woman like do you know or even just even imagine if you were in her position would you want to kiss her anyway let's see and i do like the the thing with the shakespeare you know that's the next you know the the first thing the robots are going to do to make us believe they're just like us is they're gonna say simple phrases that just get across you know they're basically stating exactly what they want you know he's saying I want to come back with you you know the the I'm um, you know just yes saying things that may you know and later they're gonna try to you know they're gonna be like well sometimes they quote famous literature I guess we could do that and you know not and and it's very robot to not real it's very ai to not realize quoting shakespeare over and over that no that actually makes you kind of annoying that may that doesn't make you relatable you know but he's a douchebag so they're just like oh, that's that's the douchebag being a douchebag you know the the that's a good and and it is like you know right, the first time he quotes shakespeare joe says i didn't know they made shakespeare comic books Burn, which is a great, because this movie isn't at all inspired by any kind of comic book, even though, like, I don't know if there's a specific comic book, but I'm, it's a kind of comic booky concept, let's be honest. But anyway, yeah, you know, it is the kind of thing where, you know, you kind of notice he's quoting Shakespeare, and you're like, would that guy know Shakespeare? You know, but, like, you kind of just, you just move on, you know, so that's a, yeah, I do quite, that's a, that's a, yeah. Now, 
Let's see. And, and you know, after him, then they finally nailed it. Jessica is completely convincing. You know, we, we believe that she is a, a person until the reveal. And, yeah, so they have to clear a path to the rocket, which is legit. You know, that I, I do like this. You know, it's a it's a trope, but I like it. It's the this thing of we've reached. You know, we're in this post-apocalyptic world. We've reached a place where there's something for transportation, but there's something that has to be dealt with. For, you know, sometimes it's fuel. This in this case and others, we have to move stuff away in order to get. Is is there a? I feel like there might be a Left for Dead level where you have to get stuff out of the way before you can... Yeah, there's stuff that has to be moved into position before you can make your escape kind of thing. You know, it... Yeah, it's a trope. And... Unfortunately, then, you know, I, I feel like... Yeah, I think I don't think there should have been an action climax. I think it should have ended with, you know, they man, you could have some tension there, just, like, the, you know, you have a time, you have a timer countdown, you have this thing of, of, you know, so many, only so many seconds before the rocket leaves on its own, we have to get in there, you know, just have that be it, you know, and they're arguing over who gets, in, who goes, and she goes, and, you know, yeah, like, then, like I said, as it's, you know, as soon as it's left, he turns around and sees, yeah, maybe have it be from the opposite end, so that there's, or wait, yeah, yeah, just have, you know, have him see that there's robots, and he recognizes, he realizes one of them is a Jessica. Now, but, but yeah, instead we have Chuck attacking, and he tosses Joe off, who grabs the crane and then they fight on there and I gotta say here at the end the robots talk way too much after we realize they're robots I get it I get it you're doing the thing we we all know the thing but that's one of the things that works extremely well about you know if you watch the first two Terminator movies they don't tend to taunt very much and here they can't stop taunting you know it's just like I, I do appreciate, you know, the, at, at one point Chuck says, I used to wear the face of, what was it, um, ah, doesn't, oh, right, right, I know where I have it, I have it in, ah, uh, hold on, that's, oh, well, there it is, um, There it is. Marshall Richard Cooper. I used to wear the face of Cooper. Now I wear the face of Becker. I will like to wear your face. Or oh, wait, am I thinking of the wrong per Oh, whatever. Anyway, you know. I'm looking forward to wearing your face. And then he repeats something that Joe said earlier in Joe's exact voice. And you see the lips, his own lips move. That was cool. I, I wish it was just, yeah, just have it be, you know, the, the, um, have it be that Joe notes, I thought you were, so you've worn more than one face. And then he smiles, you know, and, and maybe nods. And, and the, the, yeah, yeah. And then Joe says, I bet you have more faces you'd like to wear. And, and he, like, turns his head slightly, opens his mouth, and then Joe's own voice comes out. Just that would, you know, you'd get that across without this damn chatty robot. And, let's see. I don't necessarily hate that the, the, the fact that there's... I think the the fact that there's room for only one person on the ro rocket, I think they knew that a little earlier in the short story. I don't hate that it's a last minute reveal. I think that works fine. And yeah, the two Jessicas fight each other. I thought they were going to do the thing, and I actually was a little like, oh, 
fine, you know, whatever, you're going to do the thing. I thought they were going to, because at first she's wearing the helmet, but then the helmet comes off. And it's like, is he going to have to shoot one of them not knowing who it, oh, no, never mind. No, he doesn't. You know, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't have liked that, but it felt like they were setting that up, and then they just don't do it. Anyway. And, you know, the, the thing of, you know, you were afraid of what you would do. You know, that, that is legitimate. And that's a very, that's Philip K. Dick right there. Um, being afraid of something that you don't know about yourself that might hurt others. That's a really, so, so, but, but, yeah. Let's see. You know, honestly, you could have had that. You could have, you know, the, the ending that I explained before with, you know, Jessica takes off and then he sees the other Jessica and he realizes she's a robot. And then he says, that's why you didn't want to leave. You were afraid of what you do. You know, you could, and it, you could still, there would still be some ambiguity of the, yeah. And... Yeah, so it ends with the with this thing of of love instead of the the Yeah, so that's that's very corny, not very doesn't doesn't really fit this particular story at least. You know, I mean if you wanna do Phil K. Dick and you wanna get corny, like there are other I don't know if that I could think of of one off the top of my head, but some of them can can get very corny. There's one where there's these aliens that look human, but they're not the same size as human beings, unless they smoke a cigar or drink some liquor. And you know that's pretty. You know it's not it's not the same kind of corny, but that's kind of corny. You know anyway. That brings us to the final section notes taken before watching and yeah so unlike the short story this does not really have a downer ending now let's see uh, so yeah the movie is in part about a war between those who let's see yeah, those who would solve the energy crisis with a source of energy that is polluting nature, killing people, and the people who don't want to use that source of power. This is, of course, a conflict in reality, though it hasn't led to an actual war the way that it has in the movie. And, yeah, the movie does not acknowledge that green energy is a viable substitute. You know, I realized that when the movie was made, it may not have been a complete solution. It was definitely clear that it would become that in time. The movie is set you know, 2078, so the, um, let's see, but it does acknowledge how much pain, misery, and death that dependence on a dangerous, uh, you know, energy fuel source leads to, and I will grant there wasn't really room, to, to be fair, there was not, it, the movie would be very different if even even if they had a throwaway line, because it would imply maybe eventually we'll get there, when the short story and movie are very much about things going badly. It's not really there's not really a lot of optimism and hope anywhere in either of these versions. So yeah. Now in the uh, let's see. Yeah, so I already mentioned in the short story, the, the claws are the next logical step after atomic bombs. They're even being made in the same factories that used to make atomic bombs. The atomic bombs basically killed everyone that wasn't in a bunker. Then the claws were made to take care of people who were in the bunker, like how we see in Terminator. There's a Terminator clearing a bunker. And, you know, in both of these, it points out the fighting doesn't end with nukes. Let's see, and there's a humanoid claw that is able to pass for human because its inhuman speaking and expressions and such are just like people who grew up in this kind of environment. It is a dehumanizing world, thus it can be vulnerable to things that look and sound but not behave human. And, you know, that's also in the... Let's see... You know, you could... You could 
you know, I'll grant that if if you saw like Arnold Schwarzenegger in post nuclear fallout, you know, you would wonder how could he possibly look like that. But then, you know, this, he's not the only one that looks like that. Though, you know, it's only Terminators who are like huge, muscly beasts in the first Terminator movie. But you know, some of the soldiers, you know, they're not like these tiny, scrawny that you would expect from a post-nuclear world and and like sickly and everything you know but anyway the the ah uh, where was i going with that the the place that i was going where with that was that yeah you know the the yeah so you have you know the the James Cameron has said in an interview that one of the things he wanted to point out with the 1984 terminator was that we've become so desensitized in society that someone who's like if you look at them you would think that's not a human being you know th there's no there's no life in the eyes there's no, you know these things that they would be able to pass for human and that's also you know so yeah and and in the in the in the terminator show there are also you know, Terminators that in the future are able to pass as human because you would expect the war to make them that kind of, yeah. And, yeah, once you realize David was a robot, you look back and all the things it said make perfect sense. It says, it's looking for things, th that's right, oh my god. See, that's something, I don't think that was in the movie, and that's one of the best lines. Like, you know, Joe is like, you know, what what are you doing here? looking for things to eat we think oh poor little thing he's struggling to find food no 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 in reality it's talking about people it wants to follow the military officer so that it can get to some people and num 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 eat us all up you know that's that's the thing that it's that's the kind of food it's looking for it's not lying technically it's just being vague enough you know but that's that's such a, you know, just, yeesh. And, you know, it says, you know, it wants to follow. You know, can I come back with you? We think, oh, it's scared, it's lonely. No, it wants to follow him back to base so it can kill everyone at the base. And, let's see. And, let's see. Yeah, I already talked about the that part, and yeah, so, you know, the movie gets some effective horror out of humanoid beings that look close to human, but there's something off about them. You know, unfortunately, this kind of thing can worsen transphobia when the vast majority of trans people in real life are just looking to live a normal life. They're not the ones grooming kids. That's conservatives, such as Matt Walsh. And... Let's see. Yeah, so the the thing 1982 very specifically only has male characters. All of them appear to be straight, so sexuality never comes up. The short story this is based on and the movie does have at least one female character. The men appear to be straight. And yeah, so you know, in the in the short story, you know, basically Jessica saved some of the humans from the the other claws. You know, she could have killed them. She had plenty of opportunity to, but if she, you know, it was it was in order to get into a situation, you know, yeah, and and the, you know, yeah, the fact that you know, so she is using sex appeal, and the yeah, the I mean, the movie it is there. I, I forget if they said that the the men were, were having sex with they might have felt that that was a little too uh, yeah and and like i said you know there are definitely some misogynistic things in the you know there's there's a lot of stories where you know if you read into it a little bit clearly it was written by a man who was afraid of losing something of himself to a woman that he had sex with so for that, I definitely do appreciate that this one, the female robot, loves the man and isn't, 
But then why the why the sponge bath? Yeah, I I don't know. It just it felt yeah. I do appreciate that at least they didn't feel you know, they they don't actually you know, it doesn't show her topless. It shows her, you know, we we realize that that's what she must be, but we don't you know, it's just it's not necessary to to show that. Now, you know, so so it is it's not going as far in objectifying her as it does as as it could. So that's nice at least. Anyway, the thing nineteen eighty two has grotesque body horror and as such a lot of reaction shots and the you know, this one does not get as you know grotesque with it, but it's also a very different kind. So yeah. But but yeah, there is there is some quite good uh, yeah, and yeah this one one user review point out three surprise endings tagged on to the end that could have eliminated all could have been eliminated altogether without hurting the story much. Now the you know so yeah the the movie kind of subverts the twist from the book. You know in the book it turns out the the you know. In both, it turns out that Jessica's actually a goddamn robot, but in the movie, she's learned, learned to love, and she doesn't want to, to hurt anyone, you know, it's, there is, there is some chance of a future that doesn't include just destroying all the robots, because, uh, you know, evidently they do feel and think, you know, so, yeah, the, the, they, they subverted that, yeah, I wish I th I think it could have just ended like that. Like take away I think his name was Chuck. Take away fighting against Chuck or like I said eliminate the the those lines. You know, yeah, yeah as it is, you know, you have a uh, the the robot, yeah, the, so the three you have uh, the robot that looks just like Joe's friend, which is, you know, I get he's having to fight someone he used to think of as a friend, which, you know, if you don't do that at all with this kind of concept, you'd feel like you were losing out. But they didn't find a particularly organic way for it to be there. You know, yeah, of course, there's robots after them. But, like, at the end of the day, if he isn't going to trust the robot that looks like his friend, then it doesn't really matter that it looks like his friend. He doesn't hesitate to attack him because just because they're friends you know so anyway that's one the other being the Jessica robots and the third being the um, the teddy bear and I have no more to say but I've I've talked about the teddy bear I don't I don't want to talk about the teddy bear anymore the the so so yeah I yeah I I wish that the the yeah I've pretty much talked about but anyway yeah you know, I would think that subverting the twist of the book would, by itself, would be alone. I get not wanting to just use the same twist because then everyone who knows the book knows how it knows how it ends will know how this movie ends before they start watching. But the other twists should have been dropped. They don't actually change anything. They just kind of confuse matters a little bit with the. Uh, yeah, talked about it enough. But anyway, yeah. So Philip K. Dick, like James Cameron with Terminator, which I believe was inspired by this was commenting on what it would do to us humans if there were killer robots that could look exactly like human beings. And, yeah, you know, the first two Terminator movies do a much better job than this and came out before this, so, yeah. I think this this movie would have been... Uh, if they had just made it in the 80s, you know, if they had made it before 1984 so that... Although I suppose I would not want to do without the term, then then the Terminator would have been a very different movie. Okay, overall, I guess I am happy that you know. Sorry, sorry, Christian Duguay, I don't have any problem with you, but you have not made a movie that means to me what you know the Terminator and the thing from 1982 mean to me. So the fact that you were not able to top them here is yeah. And I don't think that it's impossible to make, you know, I think that, I know 
you know, we all hate Terminator Dark Fate. I, I really don't think it's as bad as a lot of people say. It's not a good movie, but whatever. The Terminator in that, the way he talks to people, the, the little, like, you know, he, he'll approach these, you know, southern, like, sheriff people, and he'll put on a southern accent. And, let's see, I think what he said was, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, but in those five minutes, I prayed the hardest I have my whole life. You know, and they're, you know, he's he's able to get them to lower their guard within just no time at all. You know, so you can do that kind of thing. You know, and, and I'm not I'm not comparing, you know, these movies came out, what, 20 years apart, 20, 24 years apart. I'm not saying that this movie should somehow top that. I'm just saying if it had gone more in that direction, you know, I, I think that... Actually, I guess maybe that was what they were doing with Jessica. But, yeah, the robot there at the end, I wish that had been more like like something like that instead of the, the chatty Cathy. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, um, this movie does not have an antagonist who delivers a scenery-chewing performance like in Scanners 2 and 3. You know, certainly Chuck and Jessica too do get close. I do appreciate there is a little bit of a downer with Jessica one dying. You know, although why why did they feel it was necessary to let's see? So both of the Jessicas died. I guess it was the was it the evil Jessica. We saw one of the Jessicas get like burnt to a crisp, including like topless. So that's that's weird. I don't I don't want to talk to whoever felt that it was necessary to show her being burnt like they could have just shown just her face if they really badly wanted I mean even that is kinda messed up but the moment that she's anyway uh, moving on but yeah in Scanners 2 and 3 you know let's see I'll grant that it might have been in there might have been there in the script but certainly Christian either ask or let those actors completely go off the wall performances for these few cast members are so consistently out there throughout the entirety of those films that it can't have been something one of them just thought would be fun to do for one take so he must have thought it worked he didn't he doesn't do it in boot camp at the rise of evil i do not remember about live wire or human trafficking but yeah this one doesn't do that i i do think ah crap i don't what were the names i guess i'll i'll do it i'll do it the other way I'm almost 100% certain that oops, the 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 takeover king. What was his name? Something dragon. Um, crap. I'm not sure. It's Mark Dragon. Wasn't he in this also? I guess not. Okay. Um, I just thought he looked like anyway. anyway. Um, let's see, um, yeah, so I have some critic quotes. It leaves a vast number of holes and impossibilities, but I, I don't agree that all of these are holes, but some of them are definitely impossible. Who sent the fake message to make peace with the Neb and why? Was it the Screamers? Was it the Alliance's own side back to Earth seeking to betray them? We never find out. I mean, it was almost definitely Screamers. There's no, I don't know why he felt the need to to get, some people really want hand-holding in, in movie making. Anyway, no, I would definitely say the, it was, it was definitely the, the screamers that did it in order to lure them away from the, and it worked. You know, they, by the end of the movie, they did manage to take over the bunker that Joe was in at the start, so... Let's see, why do Screamers kill their own numbers? Why, for that matter, do they give their own side away? In both cases, the revelation about the nature of the David Android and the warning about the soldier androids who cry, Help me, come from people who are Screamers themselves. Is these pieces of B-movie plotting that mar what is otherwise two-thirds excellent and intelligent science fiction film? And see, that is the thing. Like, in the short story, the explanation is that they, they had started fighting each other because the, you know, the... the
um, actually, no, yeah, yeah, it's got to be, it's, let's see, I felt like I had it before, but suddenly I'm doubting, um, the reason in the short story is that the, the, you know, essentially he's saying that once you get a high enough level of intelligence, artificial or otherwise, people will start waging war on each other, you know, and, and like, you know, yeah, like, why, why did the West fight the Soviet Union? for, you know, all those years, all those decades, you know, over half a century. I feel, let's see, if it's, let's see, if it started in, like, when did World War II end? The, the 1945? You know what, the, the Wikipedia for it definitely has. 1947 to 1991 was the Cold War. You know, why did we do that? That, if, if you actually take a step back and think about it, that doesn't make any sense. You know, okay, so the people on one side thought that economic policy should be one thing, and the people on the other thought something else, and one of those groups used, you know, formed a dictatorship to enforce the way that, like, it, and, and because of that, you want to murder millions? What? That doesn't make any sense, you know, if you actually stop to think about it. And, yeah, I, I wouldn't rule out maybe this reviewer, like myself, you know, does not remember the Cold War. You know, it, the, the point, part of the point of the short story, I'm not saying it only has this point, but one of the things it's trying to do is make you realize how absurd the Cold War is. And that was something Philip K. Dick was excellent at. He, he made, you know, he did a number of stories about, you know... This, the, just, yeah, so, so, yeah, the, the, um, I, I think an argument could be made that war never makes sense, but certain, like, you know, if you, let's say you have a bug infestation and you take a flamethrower to kill the bugs, that makes sense. The bugs might kill you or destroy something that you need to live. War between human beings, like, if you look at it, it's, like, it's never truly rational. It's, it's like, you know, some, sometimes it's fight, it's, it's war over the, over access to some sort of resource. And I will absolutely grant, you know, the, the peace that we have today over much of the world, there wasn't always enough for everyone that we could, you know, it wasn't the kind of trade today that helped stave off a lot of war, that wasn't always possible. It, it used to be that people, you know, the countries didn't trust each other enough to trade this way. And yeah, if you lived in a place that was very hard to survive, be, you know, maybe you needed food, clean water, you know, there's, there's, maybe, maybe you needed space, maybe enough space to live, you know, yeah. The, the, you know, you would basically have to use violence to, to take that, but the, the, so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say that we could magically, you know, time travel and fix all these, prevent all these wars just by, you know, but at the end of the day, like, it still doesn't, it's not a, it's not a truly rational thing to do. It's, it's, um, it's a backed into a corner you know, wounded animal kind of thing to do. And, yeah, I, I think that the short story does an excellent job pointing out how irrational war is, and I, I ultimately, I do think that the movie doesn't quite nail that, and maybe if it had, this reviewer, you know, clearly they have thought about this, so it's not, this is not someone who's refusing to think about a piece of media that they watched. Now, let's, you know, I'm, it's fine if you don't want to. It's just, I, I don't have a lot to say about, I'm, I don't have a lot to say in response to stuff that isn't thought through, that's all. There's, there's media that I don't think about. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. Now, 
more critics, there are genuine flashes of Dickian paranoia and decay, such as our heroes need to smoke specially treated cigarettes to neutralize the radioactive particles they're breathing. The premise of the movie, Robot War Machines Get Smart and Reprogram Themselves, is true to the story, as, and the filmmakers have turned the, this idea into a not very subtle Bosnia allegory, with emphasis on the gory. Oh, nice. I've read that several times. It was only now that I'm reading it out loud, I realized the pun. Emphasis on the gory. Nice. Now, let's see. Right. The... Um, yeah, so one side receives a plea for peace negotiations after 10 years of war and discovers from a lost soldier that the war has been forgotten on Earth. The two sides have been left to die on Series 6B while another war is started on another planet. And I really love, you know, he points out if they if they let us, what was it, if they, if they told people that we were still here, people would hate them for it, so they pretend that we've been lost. Something like that. It also has a cynical edge lended by the way that the soldiers have been deserted by their leaders and continue to be tricked into fighting while the leaders get on with their business. Beautifully put. The same Republican self-justification for vicious behavior, the same neo-Nazi rule of killing as many brunette women as you can. In the short story, secondary characters Klaus and Rudy openly suggest... that um, I forget which is which, but... I th uh, yeah, I think Klaus is the one that in the movie ends up being knifed to death. Rudy is the one who ends up, who's constantly quoting Shakespeare. But yeah, secondary characters Klaus and Rudy openly discuss the issue amidst the looming paranoia. Klaus suggests, maybe we're seeing it now, the end of human beings, the beginning of a new society. While Rudy rebuts with, they're not a race, they're mechanical killers. Klaus and Rudy are replaced... <clears throat> By Neb soldiers Becker and Ross in the film, respectively, and both refrain from moral deliberation as each are reduced to the personification of a specific emotion. Once, like one sequence, which is my favorite, is when Hendrickson is using a computer in the bunker to discover all the different types of screamers. It was suspenseful on two counts. One, the fact that he has only a limited amount of time to use it, and second, that what emotion is left in the dark afterwards, which puts us a step behind and makes the stakes of survival even higher. Where this movie loses points is the timing of the release and the overall budget. Originally written in the 50s, you can see where other major films took inspiration, with The Terminator being one of the most notable. It's tough to tell if Screamers took inspiration from Tremors and how it depicts the robot's movements on screen, or if Tremors took the idea from PKD's work. Either way, Screamers gets the feel of being a knockoff of Tremors due to coming five years later. That is true, and I haven't watched Tremors, but I hear that one, like, if you take it on its premises, on its premise, yeah, you know, if you're willing to go along with what that movie is, it's, like, there's almost nothing wrong with it, which cannot quite be said for this movie. I know that Obscurus Lupa loves the, at least some of the Tremors movies, um, I don't know that it's, you know, I don't know, I'm not currently planning on it. And I, I certainly don't have access to them right now. Anyway, um, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, so one person says, It is never explained why or how the screamers in question went haywire. Not even a hint, nothing. And the ending goes a bit too over the top. And yeah, the... The screamers in question went haywire. See, I think he's talking about the ones that... Um, hold on. The ones after, not not the claws or the autonomous swords, but the later ones like David and and the others, and um, yeah. Again, like I yeah, I already mentioned what I feel like is the is the answer in the book. You know, first yeah, right. I I already mentioned that the reason they start fighting each other is once intelligence reaches a certain level, you know, war breaks out, even though it doesn't make real rational sense, just, you know, and the, and it is, you know, there is some, some truth to it, like, human beings, technically an animal, are the only, we are the only animal to fight war on, a, like, 
yeah, you'll have, like, conflicts between, like, I know that, is it maybe gorillas fight each other for dominant, like, there needs to be one alpha, and others can challenge the alpha for dominance, but, like, attacking the same species, and, like, we, we kill millions of each other for, you know, yeah, not, yeah, anyway. So yes, that's why they eventually started turning on each other. I think that's also why they started turning on humans. After a while, they they got so intelligent that they were, you know, the the that they started attacking all human beings. You know, I mean, the thing is, they were they were they're being made to to win a war. You know, maybe they thought that the war was easier to win if they killed all the human beings. You know, but yeah, in the, in the short story, it took place away from it. Took place down in the in the factories that used to build atomic bombs, now build machines. They're upgrading. You know, I do think that the movie could have hit harder. The point. Let's see. It's um. I'll I'll have it momentarily. Screamers. Because it is a... Huh. Okay, I thought it was... Oh, Grey Goo, I guess, is the thing that... See, I thought... Wait, is Grey Goo... Is that the same thing? Um... Crap, what's it called? There's a specific term. Singularity. Um... Let's see... Yeah, the technological singularity, I thought that was something it would... But yeah, you know, AI singularity is essentially what's what's going on. And I feel, yeah, I, I got that from reading the book. Yeah, it wasn't quite there in, in the movie. I, I agree with that assessment. But yeah, you know, the short story is essentially if the Terminator's concept of humanoid killer robots that you can't recognize by sight until they attack. You know, if, yeah, if you took that concept and then did the thing from 1982 with that. And let's see, yeah, and I wrote, you know, the movie can basically just do that, but it did come out after the thing and the Terminator. And I wondered if maybe they changed it out of concern they'd be falsely accused of ripping it off, even though the... I, I mean, I think the Philip K. Dick might come out, might have come out even before the the short story that the... Let's see, who goes there? It, oh, hold on. That's from 1938. Fair enough. So that one, that one might have inspired um, Philip K. Dick. But it does not say on... Wikipedia, if it has, but yeah, you know the the <clears throat> um, it's um, yeah the the um, but but yeah you know there is a, it is similar to to that so yeah. Um, let me know in the comments what is your favorite version of this overall concept. Is it Screamers? Is it the thing from 1982? Is it the thing from another world? Trick question. That one doesn't count because they botched it completely. Rather, is it one of the Body Snatchers movies? Which I think, what are there, four or five? It's pretty wild. I've seen like three of them. I'd like to see even more. Um, wait, holy crap, have I only seen... Have I only seen two? I've only seen two. I gotta watch more. Anyway, um, is it the episode of the Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, where they set it on a nuclear submarine and use a T-1000 to make it spicy? Uh, there might be some that I forget. Let me know. Just, yeah. What is your favorite of these? 
And yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's a screamer that's on doing its its teeth to to do they just bite? I guess that you know I guess, I guess they do chow down on people, huh? Because they open and with all those teeth, it's like and I do appreciate it's like the the saws, the saw blades that the basic version, yeah. Anyway, there should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, as well as one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode available to myself here in West Western Europe of True Lies, The Clearing and the most recent episode I've personally gotten to of Scream Queens. Recently, the Review and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. And once there's an MCU show, I'll do that. Once there's a Disney Plus Star Wars show that's live action, I'll do that. And I will get into the, the more recent animated ones. I just gotta catch up with all the old animated ones first, so I'm not, like, missing illusions and such. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalogs. Let's catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time. Keep screaming.